an ag on Thursday. Um, and we're pleased to be joined by Gus Selig. Uh, Gus, you have some updates for us. Hopefully we were trying to um, get you guys uh, engaged in some technical support for farmers looking for assistance. Why don't you just uh, tell us what's happened since we spoke in June? Okay, well, Mr. Chairman, or Acting Chairman, thank you very much. And Senators Hardy and Senator Collamore, it's good to be with you today. Joining me are people who will be able to better answer your questions as you delve down, which are Ella Chapin, the director of our Farm and Forest Viability Program, who's actually joining us from her vacation. So thanks, Ella, for breaking away from it. And Mariah Knopf, who is the person at the other end of the phone when people do call our offices looking for assistance. And I'm just gonna briefly say a few things. Um, we began, and you, you got a report from us that I think Linda has and has posted um, on our activities through July. But really from the beginning of the pandemic, um, we turned our farm and forest viability resources toward helping farmers navigate through the pandemic. Uh, we led generals gave us $50,000 because they understood we could immediately begin to connect people with resources. Um, and there's really been two forms of work and, and you followed up then with an appropriation of $192,000 which we're using some of, but most of which is going to both private contractors that we have long working relationships with, as well as some of our usual partners. And Ella will, it's in the report, but Ella will go into more detail. There's been two focuses of our work um, to this point. One has clearly been helping people navigate the availability of resources, whether they've been federal in nature, like the PPP program, or now that, um, the Agency of Agriculture is standing up programs, helping them with that. We've also helped a number of ag businesses and forestry businesses who have needed to pivot their businesses in de dealing with and developing the plans to do that. Um, and Mariah is happy to share with you some of those stories, but that's the brief overview. The work uh, when we reported to you at the end of uh, July had touched 146 businesses. Uh, we're now well past 260 businesses that have been seeking assistance. And I think, Linda, do you have a slide you can share with the committee that Jen yes. provided this morning? So why don't we just put that up for a moment? And um, so this just sort of sums up the types of work and the types of assistance um, that we've been providing, uh, whether it's financial and cash flow planning, dealing with shifting markets, developing online and direct sales strategies, but also health well being and mediation resources. When we reported to you at the end of July, I think at that time, 45% of the businesses we'd help were dairies. Obviously with the rollout of the Ag Agency's dairy program, that's gone up as you would expect. Uh, it's a little bit more than half, but there's a lot of work going to other parts of the working lands, businesses that include value added enterprises, slaughter, diversified livestock, produce, and so on and so forth, as you can see. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ella to go a little bit deeper um, than I have. And then, and we're happy to answer your questions and. Uh, I think we're hoping to not take more than about 15 minutes in overview and be ready to answer whatever questions you have for us. So Ella, the floor is yours. Thanks, thanks. Gus. Thanks, everyone. Um, thanks, Gus. I'm just going to add a little bit more detail um, and can ask any sort of big pic answer any big picture questions folks have, and then Mariah will share some stories from the work. Um, you know, essentially we. We have long always been the long-term sort of non-emergency planning program um, supporting you know, many organizations around the state that do the business assistance work, business coaching work across the state, including UVM Extension, Intervale, NOFA, the Center for an Agricultural Economy, Wyndham Grows, 
um, the Sustainable Jobs Fund, basically every organization that does really in-depth business coaching, business advising for the agricultural sector, um, and now also in the wood product sector, we, uh, we fund and guide that work through our long-term business assistance. When we, um, in mid-March, when we realized things were really changing rapidly for businesses in our sector, uh, not to mention every individual in the state, we um, really launched an essentially new and slightly different version of our program, uh, this rapid response business coaching, which you've heard about. You know, I just wanna articulate that it's, it's, it is a really different format and structure, although it does use many of the same business coaches. Um, we've leaned very heavily since mid-March on private sector independent um, business consultants who had more flexibility than many of the organizations in our network during a time of when, when many of our organizations had lower capacity and staff with children who were at home and uh, other needs. So consultants have really helped fill a lot of the gaps that we saw starting in mid-March. Um, but at this point, um, and with the CRF money, we are particularly supporting those organizations in our network to um, take on new projects to do COVID-related um, rapid response assistance. Um, so we've really stood up a new program, not unlike what we did after Irene, but Irene didn't have nearly the scale of impact on the number of businesses that obviously we're seeing today during this pandemic. Um, so we feel really good that we've been able to do this with the financial support from WeLab and a few other um, uh, smaller contributions we received in the spring, and now with the CRF money to extend this work through December. It's been incredibly important to the businesses that have uh, asked for help. And it's also been really critically important for a lot of the organizations and particularly the agency of ag um, as they launch uh, the dairy and then the non-dairy grant programs as well as um, the Department of Forest Parks and Rec and other agencies um, were providing a lot of uh, sub support structure um, for folks who are trying to navigate those grant programs. And in, and in you know, March and April uh, and, and into May, we were primarily um, supporting or, or a huge amount of our support was going to businesses trying to navigate federal programs, IDLE and the PPP and other um, loan and um, grant and unemployment programs. So that's really been where um, the report that we submitted to you for July 31st um, shows that about 59% uh, of clients that we've helped out of the 192 helped through the end of July um, had received help around sort of financial planning and cash flow management and figuring out the rapid changes and what was happening with their business financially. Um, sometimes that's used to also then apply for some of these relief programs, but 87% of clients had ha received help with one of the various state or um, federal relief programs. 41% of businesses that had been through our program across the different types of businesses that you see on your screen um, had received help with changing markets and um, losing some markets and finding new places for their products. Uh, 30% had received specifically help with changing retail, um, going either online or to retail sales channels and the, uh, you know, sort of um, internet infrastructure or sales and marketing infrastructure that needed to change in order to do that. Um, and then some you know, smaller percentages, but still very equally important, helping folks access new forms of capital, helping folks with uh, land access and um, and transfer issues that relate to COVID, and then about 20% needing help with sort of uh, regulatory and food safety and uh, new COVID-related procedures and practices. So those are there's just a real range of types of assistance that people have gotten. You saw sort of the uh, on your screen is sort of the summary of that. But I just wanted to help you understand that much or most of what we've been doing is helping people navigate sort of financial and market sales-related shifts and particularly accessing the various, many various federal and state programs. Um, I wanted to also mention that this has been a really interesting opportunity to reach some types of businesses that, or some business owners that 
maybe in the past had not sought out help from the viability network and we we're seeing folks come in because they're perhaps applying to one of the state grant programs and they needed some help just understanding how best to do that. And they've gotten just a little bit of coaching from either Mariah on the phone and on our staff, or she's put them in touch with a business coach to do a little further assistance. And then they realize, oh, the viability program overall could help us in the long run with our business. And so we are seeing some folks come in through this rapid response program and ending up in our, our, our viability program overall for the longer term. Um, so I think I will, um, oh, and then I wanted to just go over sort of how the CRF funds are going out the door. Um, we have about 100,000, a little more than 100,000 of the 192,000 committed to um, about half a dozen organizations and uh, almost a half a dozen um, independent consultants to do various types of business coaching programs. A couple of organizations are running some cohort programs where peers hear from each other about how they're navigating uh, COVID time. They are then getting one-on-one -on -one business coaching on the side. Um, so both the Sustainable Jobs Fund is running a, co a couple cohort groups as well as Wyndham Grows. Um, the NOFA Vermont is receiving some funds to, uh, to launch a marketing and sales assistance program, as well as do some work with um, uh, meat processing businesses, UVM Extension and, um, and Farm First and the Vermont Ag Mediation Program are all receiving some funds to do some additional work with clients that we send their way or that they hear of um, that need COVID related uh, transition help. And um, and I think that's most of the organizations that we are currently contracting with. So a lot of those funds are already contracted and, and getting some work done on the ground. And we expect a lot of that work to happen during sort of late August through, um, through the beginning of December. Well, great. Uh, Senator Collimore. Thank you, Senator Pearson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ella and Gus and Mariah, for joining us this morning. Um, if I did the math correctly, and maybe this is in the total report, which I admit I have not read yet, um, but if 55% uh, of the folks that you've helped out were dairy, I'm assuming that's about 143 dairy farmers of 55% of 261. Can you break down how many were large, medium, and small and do you know, or perhaps is that a question for the Agency of Agriculture, how many of those farmers have actually received a check by now? And then the same would be true for the non-dairy to be fair to everybody. Yeah, Mariah might have a sense of a breakdown between small, medium and large or um, for the dairy farms that we've been helping, but it's been a real breadth uh, across the board. You know, as you know, there are far fewer LFOs and MFOs than there are CSFOs and, and small dairy farms. Yep. Um, I know that what generally we've helped many, many, many small and um, CSFO dairy farms just trying to figure out eligibility and how to access and prepare their um, financial materials for the dairy grant program. Um, I think we've also helped with sort of changing business models and uh, doing some on, uh, direct sales for dairy farmers um, across the spectrum of small to large. Um, but we definitely over the past month have helped a, 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 a very large number of dairy farms. In fact, at one point when we got a report from the ag agency, this was probably two to two and a half weeks ago now, uh, we heard that about half of the completed applications they had received and that they were reviewing had had help from one of our advisors. I don't know if that stat is still true, um, uh, but maybe Mariah can provide a little bit of an update. And, and definitely, I don't think we're aware how many folks have gotten checks, but we know that there is, you know, a, a, a very multi-step process at the, ag, at the ag agency with like I think three levels of review. So we know it does take time once they have completed applications and getting to a completed application is not easy. Thank you. Mariah, did you want to chime in? 
Yeah, I can speak a little bit to that. And thank you, Senator Collinmore, for the question. Um, so in terms of the the size question, I would agree with Ella that we've worked with a majority on the, the small and certified small operations. We don't have the exact numbers on the breakdown of each farm type, um, as also not, not every farm we work with ultimately fills out the intake form that we have. Um, so I, I can give you kind of a, that general sense and, and that we have worked with a real diversity of businesses and that um, especially seeing the need for support um, among smaller dairies with, who don't have computer access with help for this, um, this dairy grant application. Um, I would also say in terms of the whether, you know, how many folks have received payment at this time. Um, the Agency of Agriculture is keeping very detailed track of that, and they do have that broken down by, um, by farm size and um, whether or not those farms are hitting their maximum amount. What I understand from the agency as of our last update is that large farms have all hit their caps basically on just milk price losses alone, whereas small farms and, and certified small farms are not hitting their cap on the price loss alone and need to include other economic harms in those applications. Thank you. Ella, uh, well, does anybody else have a question? Ella, you, you check, Senator Hardy. Oh, that's, that's okay, go ahead, Chris. You can go first. <laughs> well, Ella, you mentioned something that uh, as I re-listen in my mind, as I'm organizing my life here, <laughs> so excuse me for being late and everything. Um, you mentioned that farmers are now engaging with your other services outside of COVID relief. And could, could you just tease that out a little bit? Because this committee went round and round about the idea that as we're using this to reach out to farmers, we ought to make sure everybody knows that some of these resources are available. And it was bizarrely challenging to get that through in the end, um, but it sounds like maybe that was worthwhile and we don't get to celebrate uh, victories very often. So could you just tease that out a little bit for us? Sure. Um, our long-term business planning program is essentially a two-year commitment um, by, the, by the client, by the business owner or operator or their family. And so it's a it's a pretty it's a pretty deep dive, and um, often a business coming into our program might get to know one of our business advisors first, or be working with NOFA or the Intervale or UVM or one of the organizations on some other programming, maybe more production related, um, and they hear that they could work with that same advisor or someone else in that organization or within our network on you know a business plan or a succession plan. But you know the depth of our regular programming is is quite substantial, and people sometimes think about it for years before they say, "Okay, I'm really ready for that program." So at least for VHCB, our our viability program has always focused on long term deep engagement with clients, and and conversely, the client or the business needs to be ready to make that kind of um, longer term commitment and be looking at really big picture uh, planning issues in their business. And that said, um, many of our organizations that we fund and support and are part of the viability network doing that kind of work also have their own programs that are for shorter stints of assistance, whether they focus on beginning farmers or they focus on production help um, or whatever it is. So there's multiple entry points for folks into our network and then ultimately to a longer term business assistance program when it's an appropriate fit. Uh, because our because VHCB manages this as sort of a funder and and providing guidance and um, and uh, ensuring sort of the quality control of the program and our staff don't actually deliver that business assistance you know it's a it's a network that does that um, you know we've we've been able to stay focused on that long term assistance in really in depth work while those other organizations provide some of those other services. Um, uh, where was I going with that thought? I think um, when Irene hit, none of our organizations really felt like they had the right funding to do the emergency kind of planning work that they needed to do to just help people assess their financial situation. And yet it was the same group of business advisors that had the right skill set for that. 
So we, at the time, just sort of released some of our con some of our contracted funds that were out there already with organizations. We said, you know, instead of doing three really in depth projects with three re farms really in depth, why don't you work with thirty businesses? in a rapid way to help them through Irene. We were able to sort of redeploy some of our resources that way at the time of Irene, particularly with UVM extension, and that was really effective. So we, doing that now, um, and we started off with redeploying some of our funds the same way as we had in Irene, but it was nowhere near the resources needed to address the COVID pandemic. Um, so what I think I'm trying to say is uh, in that shift, the same organizations and people are available to do really short-term rapid response work, but we and they are able to um, attach them to the, to the whole resource network that's out there. And so it's a great way to get people sort of into a system of assistance and then help guide them to the right resources. So sometimes Mariah is just redirecting their interest to a resource that exists out there. And sometimes we're, be, we're able to sort of patch in for like a six hour consulting stint to help people sort of get over the hump of the immediate decision they need to make. Do I apply for PPP or IDLE? Or, you know, do I, you know, what, what funding source do I, do I need to go and how do I go about being prepared for that? To then like, okay, now I need to think like, if I, now I, I, I know I got the PPP loan what am I gonna do with my business? Like, am I gonna stay open or am I gonna sit, change sales channels? And that can be a longer term spot. I, mean, I think it'd be maybe worth jumping in. Well, I know Senator Hardy, you had a question, but I would like to make some time for Mariah to just share a couple of the stories. because I think that'll help give some examples of this. Um, and so we are seeing a couple of those businesses transition from the sort of COVID CRF type funded assistance to where we have other funding resources for the long-term business assistance um, and other resources that exist out there that don't need to be covered by CRF dollars. Okay, thank you. Senator Hardy, do you want to jump in with a question or should we go ahead? Well, I, I, I'm happy to hear from Mariah. One quick thing though is, Linda, um, do you have this longer report that um, Ella and Gus referred to? Um, I can't find it on the BHCB website or our committee website. So um, maybe if you could email it to us or something so we have it. Um, that, to look at. And also, Ella, are you doing another one, sort of an update at some point? Okay, that'd yeah, be great. You'll have um, one next week. Um, but I, I'd love to hear Mariah, and then I have a couple other just small questions. Okay, yeah. turning to you, Mariah, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in terms of kind of how we're also trying to structure the, the services that we're providing for COVID response and kind of creating that continuum of service that really attaches to our longer viability program is also when I'm, for instance, making matches with businesses who need certain types of support um, that are, you know, it, they may indicate some short term support needs as well as longer term ones. So part of what I'm, I'm doing with folks is matching them with an advisor in our network that maybe that would be a great fit for them for longer term advising as well. And so really, as, as folks may know, um, working with farms through these variety of challenges, it's really important to build that relationship and that trust with an advisor, especially when looking at that, that longer term two year programming. So this is a really great opportunity to, to build those relationships with an advisor network as well as connect them with the various resources across the state. So that's been a really great um, entry point. And then just in terms of a, of a story that, that kind of captures that. So um, we had one um, larger operation in East Montpelier that was experiencing um, large losses in, in their milk price and, and declines due to quota from their cooperative and reached out to us for COVID support to, um, to assess that, but also um, we're considering diversification strategies to not only make up for those losses, but also seeing a need in their community for local meat products and thinking that that may be a great place for them to enter the market, um, diversify their market streams, be more viable into the future while also um, supporting their community with food security challenges. Um, and so they, they entered our COVID response program, were able to connect with an advisor to kind of begin 
the initial uh, initial strategic planning work on that and then realizing that there's a lot more planning to do a lot more in-depth financial analysis and market research about this new diversified meat enterprise that they've actually gone on to enroll in our full program as, as we recognize the need for additional resources and support in the longer term for that for that enterprise. So that's that's one example of how kind of this service flow has been really effective for folks. And are there any examples of people that um, you haven't been helping in the short term, but are gaining knowledge about the longer term options? This was one of the things that we were also trying to accomplish. Yeah, I can speak a little bit to that, Senator Pearson. So um, I'm receiving a, a variety of phone calls directly um, for varying types of support. And within those phone calls, you know, even if it's something like, I don't have my unique dairy identification number for, for this program, which, you know, ultimately is not something I can, I can particularly help them with as I don't work um, on that application directly. Um, but that Within that conversation, I'm able to ask more about their business, what kind of other things they're experiencing, and you know, even being able to offer, you know, not only the resources of our program and our extended network, and explaining a what our program is and what we do in this short-term period as well as the long-term, but also being able to provide information. For instance, you know, speaking with a farm who is having challenges uh, paying their utility bills, and and we're sharing that story with me. I was able to say, well, I believe that there's just a program that's been launched that is able to cover some of those costs um, through the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. Let me connect you with the person who can talk to you about that program. So I think that it's been a really great opportunity to make sure people are connected with a variety of resources that the state is offering, including those of our program. Thank you. Sarah Hardy. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was looking for some stories, so um, that's helpful to hear those directly. And I, I'm assuming that in your, your dairy numbers are also cheese processors. Are you working with cheese processors? Okay, I assumed that. Um, and I think Caroline and um, Maddie are gonna speak to this issue, but I'm wondering what you all are seeing in terms of the complexity of the application itself. Um, we've heard varying stories as to whether the application is easy or not easy. And um, it sounds like if they need a lot of technical assistance, it may be more complicated. Um, and how do you, is that true? Are you finding that people are finding the application complicated? And how does it compare to the sort of general business application um, in terms of its complexity to complete and actually get money? I can, I can take a first stab at that question, although again, Mariah might have some very specific examples she can share since she's the one on the phone with folks. Um, we are definitely finding and hearing that the dairy grant application is generally more complex. It has, it has more questions and more specific information that it that's required than, um, so, than particularly the ACCD um, or the FPR applications. Uh, it, they came with some very different criteria, and at least from our business advisor's perspective, uh, we've worked really um, at length before and during the launch of the dairy program and the non-dairy program to uh, to just work with that ag agency to think about how they can evaluate certain financial criteria. Um, so I think that uh, it's just been a complex process and standing up these programs with a moment's notice has just been an incredible lift for each agency and um, and for us too. So we've been able to work really closely with the ag agency on all of this, having like weekly or multi calls every week to sort of hear their, where they're at with the launch of the application and, and since then. So maybe Mariah can provide a couple of, um, of examples, but it's, um, we're finding generally that when people can access the help, which we're providing as well as many other others are, um, they can get the answers and move forward and figure out the application. And we were really asked to help everyone who didn't have computer access because all of these programs are not accepting anything other than electronic applications. So that, you know, just that piece is, is a challenge for some. Um, so it, it just each business seems to need a different level of help and have slightly different questions that they need help with and some need a lot of support and some need less, but certainly it is a complex application, unfortunately. 
Mara, are, you are you working add? also with the the forest products yes, that, yes. that's going through the department of forest parks and rec you yes. are doing working working is that as complicated or is that more simple <laughs> I can speak oh, yeah. a little bit to that. Ahead, um, I would say on on the forest side, it's it's mainly focusing on the change in revenue from 2019 to that same period in 2020, and not really including any of, you know, identifying the other economic harms. And so I think that um, to go back a step to to thinking about some of the the challenges with the dairy application, I think part of that is just. Um, technical access and ability among the the primary audience for for that grant program and that 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 has just been a challenge and also recognizing you know that there there is a lack of broadband access and and that some folks just don't don't have access to those um, to that type of technology so I think that that's been a challenge and for those that do have access there's there's just some challenges related to um, getting the proper documentation together and so what I would say that this this program has also kind of put a fine point on is the need for additional technical assistance support around bookkeeping and, and making sure that those financial records are readily available for, for programs like this. I think that we saw that same exact issue with the federal uh, relief applications as well. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I would say that, that those have been the challenges and then around kind of that other economic harm section, it's just, Kind of figuring out what a what are the impacts that I've experienced and really understanding those, um, because as we know, dairy farmers don't are are saying you know I I'm just doing my best I'm doing my work and may not want to necessarily reach out and and feel like they're asking for support and preventing another person from getting it. So um, I think that just you know a communication around that has been important as well, knowing that these funds are available for you. You're not taking away from anybody else to to apply and to look at those other economic harms. Um, happy to happy to go into detail as needed on, on those items. Sir Palmore. Thank you, Senator Pearson. Could you guys give us a, a sense of how long it might take uh, a farmer to uh, fill out an application both on the non-dairy side and the dairy side? Is it a five minute process or is it a half hour or somewhere in between? I think a lot of the work has to do not with filling out the application, but preparing and figuring out the numbers you're going to put in the application. So it really is that bookkeeping side. And so the range, it, I think it can take hours and hours and hours um, and often may need communication with a bookkeeper or an accountant or uh, where those folks aren't readily, you know, aren't on um, contract or on, uh, you know, where businesses don't necessarily have someone that they can, that they work with continually, uh, it means either they are spending a lot of time trying to figure that out or they're getting help from a business advisor or someone who's coaching them through that process or even showing up and doing a physically distanced visit with them to sort of help organize their financial information. Um, so that's where the time um, mostly is. And that's where there's also a range from someone who has you know, their monthly figures when it's not a quarterly report you need if you're looking at March through April or, or whatever the time period is and each of these programs is different. Um, it, it's finding the right information in the right format and getting that together so that then you can identify either your changes in revenues or your changes in expenditures um, and having the right information. So that can take anywhere I'd say from maybe an hour for folks uh, and my, I'm just sort of guessing based on my general knowledge. So feel free to jump in with more specifics, but anywhere from, you know, maybe like an hour to prep. And then I don't think it has to take super long to fill out the application um, to many hours. And what I think is happening in many scenarios because the information isn't crystal clear um, and um, many things need clarification from the agency. So the agency has issued many versions of clarifications and FAQ pages to sort of help clarify the application um, is that, uh, you know, many farmers will s go through the submittal process and then be told that, that it's not, um, that not all the information is, com that the application isn't complete and that there's more work to be done. So sometimes there's another phase of that. Mariah, do you wanna add some detail there? 
Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And, and, and great question as well. Um, I would absolutely agree that the, the time can be really wide ranging. I'd say from what I'm hearing from the advisors is that much more time is spent with the small operations and certified small farm operations, um, just given that they don't hit their cap grant award um, as as you know, quote unquote, easily as perhaps the larger operations just really on milk price alone and that there's just more documentation that needs to be gathered, more understanding of the justification, um, et cetera. I think another complexity um, that is that kind of was pre-existing is that there are a variety of milk cooperatives in the state and they each pay farmers in slightly different ways or their checks look slightly different. So I think a lot of information was needed about kind of which line items to look at depending on which cooperative is sending you your milk check. And our network has done a lot of really great work to actually connect with um, some of the milk cooperatives to actually be able to have them forward digitized milk checks directly to business advisors. So that's helped streamline some of the process and we're really trying to um, leverage those relationships as well throughout, throughout this advising work. And can I just jump in on the yeah. non-dairy side? Because I think your question was related to both, Senator Colmore. Um, yes. On the on the non-dairy side, I think we're similarly seeing a real range again, but, um, and we haven't done as much on that just because it's more newly released and we haven't received as many requests for help, but uh, we did do a lot of work with the agency pre-launch of that program just around how to, how to address the fact that it looks at profitability, not just revenues and expenditures. And, um, and that, that, I think that's, been a real challenge just because even just the term profitability can be, uh, you know, can be looked at in so many different ways. And, um, and so uh, similarly, I think we're finding people, it takes a real range. There's been a lot of need for clarification on different aspects of the application and, and criteria. Um, and, uh, and if anything, um, either folks are realizing very early on that they're not going to, they're not going to have the, they're not going to fall into the criteria in the right way to show the loss in um, profit uh, in in profits, um, or they're you know really struggling to to work through those different pieces. Maria, did you want to add anything? On that? Um, I think I would just add a, an additional complexity for especially that the diversified folks are kind of w their eligibility just in general for relief programming in terms of what program should they be accessing? Like what are they most eligible for and or what program might be offering the most relief? And given that businesses are generally not allowed to apply for more than one, I think that there's just been some, some confusion around when, where, and how to, to best access that relief um, given, given the variety of programs and different timing rollouts of them. My guess also is, I didn't mean to interrupt, but, um, as our chair is wont to say, the small guys uh, are feeling this to a greater degree, I think, because they don't have people, so to speak, in their office that are charged with just following all the, uh, you know, the, the rules and the regulation. I mean, these are folks that are working every single day, and they can't take time away from their work to be kind of trapped with all this uh, paperwork to do before. So I, I think it's especially important that we, uh, I don't know what we can do, but I, I have a feeling that they're impacted to a greater degree than a very large organization, which might have someone that that's their job to keep track of all this. Yeah, I think that's true for m the vast majority of our firm and food business operations, unless you're really at a pretty significant scale. Yeah. Folks are not only, you know, in, they have to work in their operation, not just on their operation every day. And on top of it, during this time, people have less, you know, may have issues with employees and labor availability. You know, they're, they're, everybody's working double time, as we all know. So it is, that has been a major challenge. And I, but I do think that this program has relieved that ex extensively. And we have been able to meet each business that has come through our door. We've been able to get them help and to help walk them through that and um, and answer some of their immediate questions and then coach them through that process and support that process. Thank you. Yeah. Let's I have Senator Hardy, she's been waiting. 
Thanks, Senator Pearson. Um, I, I, I mean, I agree on what Senator Collimore just said about, you know, most of the small farmers are, are running pretty much everything on their farm and don't have time to fill out an application, it's, it, but it's sort of a catch 22 because they're the ones that need the most help. So, you know, I'm really grateful for you guys being able to help them. Um, and I also just want to note um, one of the reasons I think that it's probably more complicated for them is because we gave a larger chunk, um, we, we uh, downloaded the, the aid so that the small farms would get the bigger grants. So it would go beyond just their milk losses um, to being able to have uh, other economic harm included in, and that makes it more complicated, but it also means they're getting more money. Um, so I did want to note that, that, you know, the complexity comes with more aid. Um, and, you know, if we could have been a, more prescient about how, it, how to make it simpler, that would have been nice. But also, I think it was intentional that we really wanted the small farms and small processors to get a larger grant um, because we knew they were suffering more. So um, hopefully the work is worth it for them. And I'm you know, really grateful that you're all there to help them through a complicated process. Mr. Chair. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I had to be away for a few minutes, but I'm glad I'm back. Um, I'm wondering when you do the uh, small farms in there, you know, you take their price of milk, is the extra charge that the co-ops are charging uh, farmers uh, because of COVID, uh, extra hauling costs that the haulers are getting uh, because of COVID, is that all added in? Those losses, are those added in to the overall uh, calculations? Go ahead, Mariah. I don't know the answer to that question, Senator Starr, but maybe Mariah has some. Yeah, thank you, Senator Starr. And yes, um, those those charges, and, and again, they come in a variety of forms depending on the cooperative. Some of them are a COVID-related surcharge. Some of them are um, other other types of like, you know, $5 per hundred weight for over over supply milk and things like that. Those are all included. That's something that our network has worked with the agency on to develop out some frequently asked question language around and that those will be included under the um, other economic harm section. And there's now language being released um, that should be um, on the agency's website at some point soon if it's not yet around um, how to claim that on the application and how to add that together and document that properly. Yeah, it's good. Um, I'm, when we talk about small farmers and recognizing that no matter the nature of the farm, they're probably pretty flat out all day. I'm curious if you've been able to develop resources that they can access after hours. In other words, obviously, if it were me, I would want to call Mariah and have her help directly on the phone. That would be just a great comfort. But at 8 p.m. or 9, 9 p.m. or whatever, that's probably not realistic. I'm, I'm hoping, Mariah, that they don't get you at some level for your life. Are there webinars or, or little videos or anything like that you've been able to do so that people can get some help uh, more independently but still gain some of the knowledge you guys have, have learned? Yeah, thank you. Great, great question, Senator Pearson. And absolutely, I would definitely send all the thanks and, and commend our partners at the agency for really developing out some really fantastic resources on their website. Um, they not only have an application guide that, that can show you the different sections of the application, they have webinars for both the dairy and non-dairy application, I believe, uploaded to their site so folks can kind of see a walkthrough of that application and see the questions that were asked and answered on those webinars. Um, they've also are consistently updating that frequently asked questions section that are really pointed questions that also our, our network of business advisors has helped to develop and suss out the answers to the issues that we're coming across when we're working with folks. Um, so all of that is available after after hours at any point and that I, I guide a lot of folks there and walk through those, those questions with them as do our, our business advisors as well. So that's been a really fantastic repository of information. Right. To add, I do, I'm not sure if your question was aimed particularly around the grants 
programs that the state's launching. But um, in addition, I know that some of our CRF funding is going to help UVM do some digital um, online educational materials that are COVID related uh, around uh, possibly um, digital marketing resources or cash flow planning tools. Um, and that, so I think some of our partners are also doing some of that work where they see a good fit to make something just more widely available. But I also will say that most or many of our business advisors are available at 8 p.m. and are talking to folks off hours just because that's how it works to connect, <clears throat> particularly dairy farmers, but just business owners in general. Yeah. Well, thank you or, for that. Hopefully Mariah's not, but um, <laughs> many of our business advisors that, that work on a flexible schedule are, are definitely adapting their time to be available. Absolutely. And I would just add really quickly that we do have a, for general broader resources, we have created a resource page that lives on our website for all working lands businesses. Um, and that's broken down by different resource types and that that is kept up to date as well. Uh, maybe uh, have, maybe you've talked about this. Uh, we're going to do a, a COVID uh, 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 change, you know, we're going to make some amendments to some of our programs that we have put out. And have you run across any particular issue uh, that we should consider maybe changing um, when we get to that point? I think the big issues we hear about and that you're probably gonna hear about in a few minutes from others who are about to provide testimony. Um, although it's really hard to imagine changing uh, criteria midstream, yeah. um, but uh, you know, I'm sure that, that has to be taken into consideration, but um, the profitability piece for the non-dairy programs has probably been the, the, biggest the biggest criteria that challenge, particularly because it's not, um, easy to fairly and consistently define and assess profitability. Um, so that's something that our business advisors weighed in on a lot, but there, as you know, you know that would re require a, a statutory ch change. Um, and then just the more criteria and eligibility could be more even across different programs is what we hear is just really challenging for both um, businesses that are trying to figure out which program is the best fit if they're, if they're not a dairy or, uh, a non-working lands business, those who fall in between have been, like Mariah said, sort of looking at different programs and trying to figure out where they'd be a best fit. Um, who, who might that, who might that be, Ella, with that particular question? What type of business? I think you've got like maple businesses and um, value-added businesses and um, a real range. I, I mean, I, I, I think it's, probably ultimately helpful for the business to be able to have access to a couple programs because like Mariah said, she, you know, they're looking where they might ha be eligible for the most funding. And so that flexibility, but, but it is confusing. Um, so I'm not sure I'm, I'm not suggesting any change. I'm just sharing sort of what we're hearing from businesses as the biggest wow. challenges are around that and from business advisors are around that profitability uh, use of profitability instead of just looking at revenues or expenses. Um, is the, the by far the biggest challenge, along with, I guess, the one other one that I would mention that we've heard is that that really small farms that are under 10,000 in gross income are excluded. Um, and that, so that leaves some very small farms or very beginning farmers without access. Um, that's, that's just what we've sort of heard. Uh, Mariah, anything you would add to those three major categories? Um, I guess the, the only area that I would add and, and with understanding that, that the timing for these programs is really based around spending for the, the, and the requirements of the CRF funds themselves, um, but that October 1st deadline, just it, I've received a lot of questions about, well, how am I supposed to receive support for, you know, September, October, November, and December losses? And so just that, that timing I know has been a challenge for, for businesses out there. Yeah, and uh, Ruth? Yeah, I'm trying to, and this may be a question for just the room or the virtual room. I, I'm trying to remember back to our conversations when we were putting together these um, grant programs about this whole question of profitability and the mm -hmm. testimony we took on that. And 
you know, a lot of the test, some of the testimony that I remember was concerned that we not direct grant money to quote unquote profitable businesses. And then it was really clear that dairies were losing money, but it was less clear that other kinds of farms were losing money. But do, do you all recall, did you come in, uh, Ella or Gus, um, and, and talk to us about that? that issue um, or hear from your business advisors at the time? Because I don't remember testimony about it. I mean, it certainly makes sense. And I understand the complexities. And looking back, I wish we had had testimony that would have directed us in a different way so that we aren't in this position. But I don't remember anyone coming in and red flagging this in this way. So I'm just curious if anyone else does. I don't. Certainly, I, don't I almost. I almost think that it might have been someone from the agency or maybe even uh, you know people that advised us that you can't take COVID money and give it to somebody that's already making money and not losing you know their shirt because there's so many people we need the money for those that are really hurting and you know but I, I, like you, Ruth, I didn't hear a soul say, you know, this is going to be a problem. I uh, could weigh in on that. This is Maddie from NOFA. I'm on the phone. Um, I don't know if y'all can hear me. Yeah. Did, yes. did you say something about that, Maddie? We did. Yeah. In the um, one of the letters that NOFA and rural Vermont submitted, we had actually specifically raised this as an issue um, when you all were considering the, the creation of the non-dairy program. Um, and, you know, I think the dynamic that was at play to my recollection was that particularly the House Ag Committee and the Agency of Ag really were, were only wanting to give the funding to dairy farms. Um, and so we had come in to testify and really share some stories of the types of losses and expenses that non-dairy and diversified farms were facing. Um, and it is, a, you know, it's a much more nuanced picture because dairy farms across the board, with the exception of, you know, some organic farms, were just losing money, you know, on their, on their bulk, you know, milk price. Um, but for other farms, it's a much more nuanced situation because they may have lost, you know, had substantial losses in some areas, but, but were able to pivot. Um, but the issue is that holding them to this strict standard of being completely unprofitable um, really is not equitable with this, the questions that you're asking of other types of businesses. Um, but to answer Ruth's question, yes, we did um, bring this up as an issue, and I'm not I'm not really sure, but it didn't it didn't seem like it got through when we raised it back in um, May or June. Well, of course, the big fight was to get the non dairy guys in to get money. Right. Uh, exactly. Along with forestry and and uh, you know the fairs and all this, and I mean this is. This was all brand new to the entire uh, Senate and legislature. And I mean, so I guess if we only screwed up on a couple of things, we're pretty fortunate. Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> well, I, I just want to add, so Maddie, um, thank you for uh, that reminder. And I do, and Bobby all, or Senator Starr also, because that my recollection is because we were in this position where we were trying to get any money to non-dairy, this was sort of a compromise position. So that makes much more sense to me now that I remember back to that whole dispute about whether or not there would be any funding. So this sort of provision was a compromise to provide. So that that is a good reminder that we were in this position of trying to get any money for non-dairy farmers at all. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Ella. Well, Anthony, I'll get I'll get you too. I'm sorry. I'll Ella. Just, I'll just quickly say that um we didn't provide testimony directly on this before and we don't quite feel like we're the right experts to do so now. But um, both no, at NOFA, our business specialist that we support, Jen Miller, um, you know, is very in tune with the financial intricacies of how, you know, how businesses 
you know, how financials work with a wide variety of business um, types. And I would also offer, you know, Mark Canella at the UVM uh, Farm Viability Program, who's a business specialist and on the staff at UVM, would probably both be excellent folks to ask more detailed questions about that. And they're both helping actively helping with application submissions so they also understand the agency's programs and what a change could implicate. So, um, you know, I, I think we have multiple organizations, including NOFA's on the phone today that can provide some of that feedback. Yeah. Um, Anthony, I think you had a, a question. No, actually, I was just going to say, Maddie already said what, what I was basically going to say, that we were trying to get the non-dairy included and we basically accepted a compromise without thinking it through enough. This no net profitability thing was something that if we had really thought about it more, we probably wouldn't have done it, but we were in a, we were in a crunch time to try to get something done. We wanted to make sure non-dairy got in there and we basically went along with something that turned out not to be very workable for the non-dairy folks. Was, like you said, Bobby, it was one of very few mistakes. So we're probably better off, at least something that we might be able to fix. It's a policy question. You know, it's not as easy as changing the dates of the deadlines, but it's something that we really need to think long and hard about making it possible for these folks to, to apply for and, and actually gain some revenue from. What, what uh, Michael? So yesterday when I was testifying in House Ag, this question came up and the agency uh, testified that they have combined the non-dairy program with the working lands grant program and the application uh, for non-dairy and working lands is the same application. So if you're working through your application and you put in that you had a profit during that time frame, it's not that you're disqualified from aid, you just get shifted to the working lands fund um, source of funds. So there's still funding and, and assistance available to those, those non-dairy um, operations that, that had a profit during that time frame. Um, I don't know if that changes what you wanna do, but I think that that is something that you should also keep in mind. So I'd like to respond to that if possible. Who is, That's Maddie. Is that Maddie. This is it's Maddie. I'd, I would just wanted to respond to that when there's time. Yeah, uh, we're gonna uh, we're gonna switch gears here pretty quick. Are there other questions for Ella or Gus or Mariah? To uh, Gus, did you have something? Well, just as you think about what's all ahead of us, I just wanted to add not to this point of a non-dairy, but um, we don't know what Congress will do when they come back. The, our delegation is pushing for an extension of the December 30th deadline. They're also pushing for more money to come through the next bill if there is a bill. And so I just would encourage you to think about, given that you'll probably be at the end of your session or out of session, how do you deal with that? Um, so our program will run out of funding December 30th and the assistance. So you, I just, I don't have a solution today, but we're happy to work with the committee about what kind of contingency plans are there, should there be an extension of the December 30th deadline and or more funding uh, to support the agriculture and working lands businesses of the state. I think just has to be part of your thinking, whether you delegate to joint fiscal or do something, uh, but hopefully there's gonna, both be an extension and some more resources. Yeah, uh, thanks for that, Gus. Uh, yeah, we, we've we already talked in a probes uh, about the date. I brought that up a couple of different times and, and that seems to be an issue that we can deal with because what they don't wanna do is complicate, uh, you know, previous uh, people that have applied with, with changes in the system uh, and, and disrupt the, the programs. And I think the agency uh, is supporting changing the date. Um, 
which will make it much easier. Um, so, uh, and if, if we do have more money coming, uh, which like Gus said, God only knows, I guess, and probably he doesn't either. Uh, if, if those guys will go to work and, and help the, the economy. Um, but um, so we, we don't need to make drastic changes if, if the deal's working for the non-dairy to get switched into the working lands, as Michael just stated, um, I think they've got, or they got six, six million, or they've got quite a lot of money, right? And working. Three point five million. How many? Three point five. Yeah, and have Maddie, have any of your people run into a problem dealing with with that? So I think the, the bigger issue is, you know, I think Michael's right that folks will get funneled into the working lands program if they, you know, were in fact profitable. Um, the problem is that they still won't be able to touch that five million. It, you know, I'm glad that in some ways the agency combined those two programs, um, but it really obscures this issue. And my concern is that anyone who was remotely profitable is going to get funneled to the working lands program, which is a smaller pot of money and also has a higher cap. I think the cap is 50,000. Um, so that might get used up more quickly. It's also first come first serve, unlike the dairy program. Uh, and so that 3.5 million, which has you know, a higher cap and less strict eligibility might get used up really quickly. And the 5 million that has this no net profit provision attached will just sit there. Um, so that's the heart of my concern. So are you saying that most of these non-dairy businesses are making money? I, I don't know the answer to that, to be honest with you. Um, I couldn't give you an estimate of, of how many of these businesses are making money, but no net profit is a really strict criteria to impose only on this particular class of businesses. Um, and it just, I think it'll be interesting to see the reports that come back from the agency of ag. And I think it'll be really important for them to report on these two pots of funding um, or actually really three pots of funding because the, the, 3.5 from working lands was in two different bills. Um, but I think it will be really interesting to see the breakdown in how those different pots are being spent down um, as of their September 1st report as due next week. Um, because yeah, again, that's my concern that businesses won't be able to touch that 5 million. And frankly, the criteria that they show no net profit um, it's just really inequitable and challenging because you all probably know farmers are not like the most profitable businesses to begin with. Um, so imposing this standard on them during a pandemic when they've had to work so hard and have had such losses, they've lost entire you know market channels um, and such expenses. If they've maintained even say they were say they made a hundred dollars in profit between March first and August first that does not by any stretch mean that they're whole. So to exclude them from the same, you know, type of relief that other businesses have access to, to cover their losses and expenses due to COVID um, is just really unfair. Um, well, Chris, you had a, we'll talk about that, but Chris, you had a question? Yeah, I, I guess I'm, you know, as we try to figure out uh, some way to address some of these inequities and, and lack of uh, efficiency, let's put it kindly. I'm wondering if, um, if there's any logic to taking the 5 million that we offered in, in the farmer relief for non-dairy and moving that over to the working lands program so that if indeed most of our non-dairy farmers are coming in through that so that we make sure the money gets them. I mean, at the end of the day, that's the goal. I, I, anyway, just curious if if that solves or maybe a, 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 an easier way to come close to solving the problem. I, I, I'm just curious. It, well, I think one, once we get that report on how the different funds are, are working and the fund balances and all of that, uh, we could certainly talk about that and um, and we'll have we'll have time I would think I know 
uh, uh, props would like to get some amendments and only do one block of amendments. Uh, but um, we should get that information from the agency prior to getting those amendments ready, I believe. But I, I still, I, I still feel funny about, you know, if these small businesses, they're doing their, probably their own paperwork. And if they can't figure out how to not show a profit, um, you know, maybe they ought to get more creative with their paperwork. Uh, and, and they're all making a profit. I mean, it, it's, um, if they're doing their own thing, seems as though they could figure that out. But anyways, um, Allie? But isn't Allie? There a, well, okay. Go. I'll, I'll just comment. I, I think I know, I know what you're saying, Senator Starr, just generally, but when it's for only a portion of the months of the year, I think that's where profitability becomes really um, not a great tool to assess just for a certain portion of the month, especially for seasonal businesses. So say one business, there's two businesses that are practically identical and one of them bought their feed for their livestock during that time and one bought it pre-March 1st. All of a sudden you have this huge inequitability between these two businesses that otherwise in the end of the year will both show probably negative profits for the year. But during that time, their income versus revenues is substantially different just because of when they made a certain annual purchase. Mm -hmm. So this is where yeah. it's just, especially looking at profitability for only a few months of the year is really maybe not a helpful tool in the agricultural sector. No, no we shouldn't have had that in there, but I mean, we got stuck with it. Uh, Chris, just, it's, not, it's not really demonstrating profitability of the business overall. No. Right. That's, and, and, and another example would be a CSA farm, which I think Chris, um, Senator Pearson maybe raised last time you met. Uh, you know, I was talking to the CSA where I get my vegetables and they, for example, you know, do a lot of their spending early in the year on, you know, things like seeds and um, other, you know, implements that they need to, to start plants in their greenhouses and things like that. So they're, they really have a large outflow early in the year, and then the majority of their income comes in, say, between March and May with, you know, their CSA signups and their plant sale, but then they're, again, like spending that down throughout the rest of the year, and their um, other accounts through restaurants were often lost or are really uncertain for the rest of the year. So that's just another example where, you know, this particular time frame doesn't actually demonstrate a farm's overall profitability for the year. It's just a, a kind of cross section, which really disadvantages potentially a lot of business types. Another example is like maple producers. Um, the maple open house weekend would have, you know, was scheduled for mid March just after the pandemic hit. And so that, you know, was a really hard hit because I think a lot of maple producers get income through that, you know, kind of agritourism, those types of events. Um, and because of the timing, they had that loss. They may have made up for it later in the year, but then they also might have fall events that are canceled. So it's just not a really, it's not giving us a clear picture of the actual success and, and viability of these businesses. Um, yeah, um, I, thanks, um, Senator Starr. I just wanted to add that I was thinking the same thing that Senator Pearson was thinking about in the easiest fix maybe to just shift the money over to this the Working Lands Fund, um, if that has different criteria. I know that the agency was concerned about having to uh, reprogram their software, um, which is a cost. And uh, I've heard that in other instances where we want to make tweaks to programs and they tell an agency say, oh, that'll cost us $50,000 to change that code. Um, so uh, I think because we need to act quickly, um, I, I think that um, thinking about it that way may be uh, an easier fix than changing I wanna, the criteria. I want to chime in there, if I, if I may. Um, I, I talked to uh, Laura Ginsberg from the, the um, agency's development section. Um, and the development section was the section of the agency that was most involved in the development of the application uh, about uh, in how far the profitability clause is an, is an issue um, for, uh, for, from the agency's perspective and how I understood um, 
if the easiest to understand the issue is to look at the agency's flow chart uh, where the eligibility criteria basically can be um, followed in, in a flow chart uh, matrix. And you can see there exactly where the profitability question comes up in the application. And um, when you answer yes, the profitability question that you get moved over to the working lands program. But there the, the problem is that you have to have at least one W2 employee so that um, basically the, um, the issue remains for those profitable farms that are sole proprietors. So from rural Vermont's perspective, um, it's again um, an issue that hits the hardest, the, the small, really the small farms with no employees um, that are basically doing everything by themselves. And um, I would, I would uh, recommend to hear from Laura Ginsberg and how far um, uh, removing the, um, the profitability clause would be a feasible, um, easy, easy or not so easy fix. That particular question, I think they can answer best. Um, my, my, what I heard, and I, of course I can't testify for them, uh, what I heard that solely removing the profitability clause might not be too big of an issue actually. Um, but please confirm with the agency directly. Um, and um, I don't know, I can't really speak to the idea of how, wh whether it would be easier in comparison to um, remove the money in the working lands fund and, and how far the working land, lands fund is um, as equitable as the other program. Yeah, thank uh, Chris. Well, can, can maybe Michael just remind us um, this net profitability uh, criteria, does it apply in the ACCD grant and others? I, I don't think it does, right? And and just, just okay, so the nods uh, for those listening <laughs> suggest that's correct. So that's a real problem. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, there's just no justification to treat a small sector of our agricultural economy different than everybody else. I, I, mm -hmm. You know, I, I agree with Senator Polina. We it was it was a tricky negotiation we were up against people that wanted it out altogether but it was a mistake and i i really do feel strongly that we we ought to think of it this way we should be forced to justify the difference and i can't think of a single justification for that myself. no i think it was totally you know we we were running fast and we tripped when that came along and didn't think of it. Um, but if, if it was only, Michael, how big a job would it be just to delete that little section? As for, uh, for drafting, it's not hard at all. Um, it's just striking out a subdivision. Uh, the, mm -hmm. It'll be about implementing. I've, I've mocked up a document for, I've heard a lot of the input and I've mocked up a document where you can walk through the Act, Act 138 and make the changes potentially that you would want. Um, so whenever you wanna do that, I can, I can walk you through um, that. It's timing, it's the no net profit, it's the reversion, um, all the all the issues that you've been hearing, once you want to walk through it and try to make your decisions about what changes you want, I can I can walk you through all of that. Yeah. Um, so are there other questions for VHCB staff? They've been with uh, with you guys for me part time um, for an hour and in 20 minutes. Um, and so, Elle is on vacation. Thank you, Elle. Oh, oh. Well, that's kind of bad. <laughs> well, we really appreciate you coming off vacation for a, an hour and a half, two hours to be with us, Ella. And uh, certainly appreciate all the hard work that you folks are, are doing to make uh, make this program or these programs work and uh, Gus will uh, will keep in mind that if we do get an extension about your 
your dollars uh, where you are helping and uh, running out at the end of the year. So um, we'll keep that in mind. And, and if there are no further questions, uh, thanks a lot for, for everything you're doing and your time. Gus, did you have something? No, I was just saying thank you and we'll see you soon. Yeah, okay. Thanks again. Thanks, Bye. everybody. Great work. Take care. Thank you so much, folks. So um, we we um, we have uh, uh, Maddie and Caroline with us. Um, is there anybody else on, Linda? No. No. Um, so would would the committee like Michael to? run through any changes to see what it might look like uh, to, to move forward uh, with some a few changes. Yeah, uh, Brian. Thank you, Master, Mr. Chair. There was one other thing Caroline uh, sent us. I don't know whether we're gonna have time to deal with it or any interest in dealing with it. It had to do with the uh, slaughter situation and um, I did get a chance to at least start to read it. She emailed it yesterday, I think. Um, so I might suggest that at least we, if we have time this morning to take five, 10 minutes to, uh, to walk through that. There's, there's a demand for that that is outpacing uh, yeah. the ability to keep up with it. So uh, maybe then we should move to Caroline to run through that uh, uh, issue. Sure. Would it, would it be all right if I said one more thing about the, the non-dairy program just while we're on that subject? Well, or we can come back I, to it. No, uh, you, you may as well jump in right now before we get started in a different direction. Okay, sorry to, sorry to jump in, but um, there's just two more points that I wanted to make. One is about the application, and I just want to flag for you all. I don't know if you actually had a chance to um, see the application itself. I know that it sounded like Michael was going to try to get a copy of it, um, but from what I understand, the net profit question is just a checkbox on the application, um, and I think that was, you know, an effort to, to not make it too burdensome for folks to answer that question, which I appreciate, um, but it also, you know, could lead to people checking it in a way that's not truthful, which I don't think is necessarily a good idea. Um, but it does mean, to my read, that it might be an easier change than um, than we think it is. And so again, I, and and I've heard as much also from folks at the agency. So I would echo what Caroline suggested about having either Laura Ginsburg or Abby Willard come in um, to talk about that. And then the last thing I just wanted to flag, it's actually an issue that's come to our attention pretty recently. Um, and I hate to, to pile on more because I appreciate so much you guys trying to address the, um, you know, the deadline and this eligibility question. So, uh, but the one other issue that we've seen with the program is that farmers markets are specifically called out in the non-dairy section in Act 138, um, but that $10,000 minimum gross sales threshold actually means the majority of farmers markets also won't be eligible. Um, so I just wanted to flag that for you as another issue because as you all probably know, farmers markets you know, often operate on shoestring budgets and um, most of them have volunteer staff. So that $10,000 gross sales minimum um, means that they won't be able to access that that money, even though they're specifically called out as a, a category of, of organization. So just flagging that for you also. Uh, Chris? M Maddie, could I just make sure I understand? Um, is it $10,000 of gross sale for the market itself as a business versus what is sold at the, at yeah. the market? Yes. Yep. I believe the way that would have been, maybe Michael can weigh in on this, but I believe the way that would be interpreted is that the, the market itself um, as the business would have had to have 10,000 in gross sales in order to qualify, which I think that threshold makes sense for farms and some of these other businesses um, so that we're not giving money to like homesteaders who raise, you know, a couple of animals, for example, but for farmers markets, that may not really work. Right. And, and it doesn't, I mean, if you're a farmer's market that operates on a $6,000 budget and you're down to $2,000, that's really a big problem. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Which meant all the, you know, the PPE and all the different setups that they had to 
um, a range, as you all probably remember, in order to operate this year. All right, thank you. Uh, how do how do farmer markets, farmers markets, how do they generate money themselves just by selling booth space? Or yeah, pretty much. Yeah, just by having vendor fees, um, which also they've lost because you know I think a lot of farmers or other vendors. For one, some vendors weren't actually allowed to vend at farmer's markets. If they were vending things like crafts or um, initially if they were selling plants, for example, they weren't actually allowed to be at a farmer's market. Um, so that impacted both that vendor and the market itself, who was then not getting that you know, vendor fee. So, Michael, is that the way... Do you is that the way we set it up or is that the way the agency is uh, determining farmer markets eligibility? That's, that's the way that the definition is set up, the eligible applicant definition. Um, you, you were looking at the USDA um, categories of farms and income generated and you use the $10,000 threshold as your minimum because you were I can't remember who just said it about the homesteader um, you were concerned about that and not going too low uh, and you know nobody really raised the issue of that income threshold for farmers markets and it's just in there it's it's there yeah Chris Nobody uh, starts a farmer's market in their backyard. Like it's not a, a not an area for scam uh, that as far as I can imagine. Don't we have a, a pre-established list of farmer's markets so that we could just sort of acknowledge them in some fashion rather than create criteria around it? Um, yeah, we have a the Vermont Farmers Market Association um, is a is run through NOFA, um, and most of the markets, at least, are a part of that. So we do, we do know who they are for sure. Right, but and correct me if I'm wrong, Maddie. The list has like duplicates on it, doesn't it? It'll have like the Burlington Farmers Market, and then it'll have the Burlington Winters Market on there, right? Yeah. Yep. You would have to figure out how to deal with. Yeah, markets so that it, are the you, same organization that have right you you can't just say that there's this many farmers markets you gotta kind of winnow the list down a little bit and the agency says that they don't know at all that they rely on nofa's list huh. i mean can't we just uh, add language michael that would exclude farmers markets from that yeah 10, yeah you, that that that's probably the easiest thing to do that's what i was gonna suggest yeah, yeah. and and then it's an easy draft and then they have to yeah. come in and apply. And if they're not a legit business, then they wouldn't qualify anyway. Yeah. Um, other questions? Uh, if not, uh, Michael, you want to run through that, um, that draft that you fooled with? Sure. Uh, there's a lot of background noise outside my windows right now, just so you know. It's like there's trash trucks and dump trucks and landscapers, and I don't know where they are, but they're all here for some reason. Um, <laughs> Linda, uh, could you put that document up? Um, so and it might be hard for you to see, but um, it's the first section would amend uh, the dairy assistance program. Uh, and if you scroll down that, Linda, you'll see some of the dates. Um, the agency said that they were looking for some greater flexibility on um, the dates. And so one of the first dates is, do they have, have when they have to show economic harm. Uh, it's between March 1st and December 1st. You could push that December 1st to eight back a little bit, um, but all CRF funds currently have a December 20th reversion um, provision. So moving that December 1st date, you have to take into consideration, will the agency have enough time 
to, to deal with any application for economic harm after December 1st and before the December 20th reversion. You see that same issue on page two, line five, um, in the demonstration of economic harm for a, a milk producer or dairy processor. Uh, then uh, you see going down in sub G, the initial application and any subsequent uh, addendum to initial application needs to be submitted by October 1st. So um, you, you've got, I think that's probably one of the, the more significant date changes you might wanna contemplate. Uh, farmers have not been uh, availing themselves of the program as, as you might have expected. Um, yesterday, Anton said that they believe about 50% of the dairy producers and processors have applied. Uh, that leaves another 50% that effectively would have just over a month to apply yeah. right now. Um, that, so, that date, that one's one that should be moved. Um, so there's that, and you will see that same October 1st date in the, um, the non-dairy program. That... The, if you move to the next page, Linda, you'll see the October 1st deadline for the addendum. So if you initially apply and you haven't been able to show economic harm up to the cap, you can submit an addendum. Uh, but you have to submit that addendum by October 1st as well. Um, I think that that's going to be an issue for anyone that's applied. Um, and didn't receive the maximum. Uh, moving down, uh, you see that October 1st deadline um, going to the next page. Um, and then if you scroll down just a little bit further, uh, all funds need to be expended by December 20th, 2020. Um, that's the current CR, the current CRF, federal CRF deadline is December 30th, but the CR, CRF, federal CRF bills allow unexpended funds to be put into your, the state's unemployment insurance funds. So the CRF default bill says that any unexpended funds as of December 20th, 2020, will be put into the UI fund. So that's, that's in a different bill, but this references that, that the, the money needs to be expended by December 20th, 2020. Do you, it's, do you recall, it, Michael, if that date was put in there to give the administration uh, ample time to collect that money and, and to get it transferred? That is why there's 10 days to get the money reverted back to the administration and deposited into UI before December 30th. It's highlighted because as Gus noted, the con Congress is coming back and they are contemplating shifting that December 30th, 2020 deadline. If they do, you might want to look at this date and change it based on whatever Congress does. Michael, can I ask a question? I, I probably should know this. The word expended, that doesn't mean appropriated. That means the money has left one account and has been sent to another, right? Uh, yes, it, it can't just be earmarked. You can't have, the agency can't have the money in its fund earmarked to go out. It has to have been sent to the farmer as a grant. The question okay. came up yesterday in House Ag, well, does that mean that the farmer has to have spent it and show receipts for it? Uh, and the agency is not interpreting the expenditure requirement to mean that they're me the interpreting it as they've issued the grant check to the farmer. 
And it makes sense in this program because this program is all about them showing economic harm. Economic harm is already an expense that the farmer has incurred, right? They're being reimbursed for their expense of economic harm. And so I think that that's a reasonable interpretation by the agency. Now, if this was about some future project, some future um, application to build something in response to COVID and they, the applicant hasn't spent that money by December 30th, the treasury guidance has said, yeah, that money needs to revert back. But here you've cool. already have an expense. Um, and I, I think that that it, it falls, it, it's eligible underneath the, the CRF terms. Okay, thank uh, you. That Chris has a question. Michael, can you help us understand the interplay between October 1st and December 20th? Is, is, am I reading this right that right now everything, if you're an applicant for either of the, either any kind of farm, you have to have your application in and any supplemental thing in by October 1st? Correct. And then... Then there was some, in our original bill, there was a, a, a moment, maybe it was October 15th, where the agency could say, wow, we got a lot more coming in to dairy than non-dairy. We can move some of the money. What date was that? September 15th. Okay. So are we addressing that <laughs> here? You, you have that option. It's, it's going to be highlighted. It's, it's section C uh, okay. in what I've got put, put together. And then, and then we're, we've given the agency effectively all of October, all of November and 20 days in December to process applications and get the money out the door. Right. Do the we agency, have to, I think the agency is very amenable to changing that date. The October 1st date. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So what have we that? heard from them how long they really need? Uh, no, I just heard that Anson testify that he's open to changing the deadlines, any of the okay. deadlines. I, I asked that uh, yesterday, Chris, I asked Anson directly, if you had the pen, what date? And he said he didn't really want to say, but the process took two weeks to vet the application, another week or so to make any modifications, and then it was another week to actually process stuff so the check is in the mail. So that means a month. Yeah. So I'm thinking November 1st or November 15th, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, and then my final question is, could we have sort of December 20th in there unless, you know, with a trigger, unless Congress extends this deadline, in which case peg it to the new deadline or peg it 10 days before the new deadline, something like that. Is that, could we get away with that, Michael? That's what I was, I was thinking about. I wanted to talk to, to JFO about how to do that that meets their needs so it's not inconsistent with some of the other um, reversion language. But I, I think if you said something like 10 days prior to any reversion of CRF funds required under the CARES Act or are required by the federal US Treasury, something like that, I think that you, you build in enough flexibility um, if it remains December 30th, it's still going to be December 20th. If they change it to July 1, 2021, then you've got uh, until July, June 20th, you know? And so I, I think that that, that uh, could be done. And I just wanted to consult with JFO about how to, to do that. And, and then the only question that remains is Gus's question of what happens if on November 1st, there's a big slug of new money. And that strikes me as a bigger question that we're gonna to have to understand across the board on this business relief. But well, I don't wanna forget could about be it. Divided up on the same proportion as the previous. Mm -hmm. That would be a and, nice problem to have, right? To have a whole new oh, system. Yeah. It would save a lot of battles if, if there was some simple type language like that, that it would be divided up proportionately like the original slug of money. Yeah, I, I don't, if you're not in session and that money comes, <laughs> I, 
I do you wait until January 1st? You know, some of these programs, not necessarily this one, but some of them are, are, are built to expire um, January 1st and not any of yours, but some of the other programs. And I, 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 I don't know, will you I need a special it. session? I would expect when we get done this particular session, we won't adjourn. Uh, I would think Tim would, and the leadership would, would just stop it. You know, we'd be on recess or whatever, and we wouldn't be working. But then if we had to go back, we could go back because if we recess, the only way we, or if we adjourn, the only way we can go back is if the governor calls us. I'll be back, yeah. Yep. Um, so that's that's definitely something to think about. Uh, you know, if there is a new slug of money, you likely will have to appropriate it again. And, and I hate to have to go through that battle again. <laughs> so that that's that's up to you guys how you want to do that yeah. but that's something the whole place is going to have to figure out not right. just right not us. Yeah. okay so scrolling should i continue on yes yes so please. scrolling down you're now going into section b which is the non-dairy program and some of this language is just going to go away once you actually get to your decisions but i wanted to give you some context you got that December 1st issue um, with the economic harm and when it was a, uh, a, accrued. Then you come to the no net profit issue on page six. And if you wanted to get rid of it, all you needed to do was to strike it out. Um, it's no. just one of the criteria for application for uh, an eligible applicant under the non-dairy program. Now, uh, how, how would that affect the application and applicants that have already uh, run into this problem? Well, that, that's a question for the agency. I don't know how the, this program only went live well, it's about 10 days ago now. Um, and so the question is how many have been awarded? Uh, how many have been funneled from the non-dairy program to working lands because they, they indicated they had a, a profit? Um, that's, that's a question for the agency. I, I, don't, I don't know that. Yeah, um, well, and it, the big issue is how many people have applied and, and really are affected as of today, I guess. Right. And, and you should be getting a report from the agency in four days uh, as to the participation in both the non-dairy and the dairy program and the working lands program. Yeah. So the next issue is again, the October 1st application. Um, and that's really it in the, oh, the issue of the $10,000 for the farmer's market. I don't have that in here, but it would be uh, an issue that you would address in the definition section of section seven of act 138. Uh, it would probably be right around um, page five, line nine. I'd probably add it in there. Uh, and so then you go to section C. This is the reversion issue, the September 15th. Um, this is discretionary authority of the Agency of Agriculture. Remember at one point, the Senate Appropriations Chair wanted all money to revert on September 15th. Um, and you convinced her for this program that that should not happen. Uh, 
but then the agency wanted the ability to have to access the non-dairy funds if they were available um, to meet demand on the dairy program if that demand was there. Um, so there's there's opportunity here for you to change this language if you don't want reversion uh, except for the December 20th reversion to meet the federal criteria or if you want the reversion to be for both the dairy and the non-dairy or if you want the money to go to something else. Um, well, Ant right? Anthony spoke about doing something uh, on the food, uh, food systems, I believe. Right, Anthony? Yeah, we talked about sending it to the food bank or somewhere where the money could be used to buy products from, from Vermont farmers. So it would be, still be assisting farmers directly by having them you know, we have the Vermonters Feeding Vermonters program from the food bank, which buys produce from farmers at market prices. So it'd be carrying through with the priority of supporting the local farmers by purchasing food from them, as opposed to just going into some other fund. <clears throat> well, hopefully and, and, it all get used, but that, well, that would sure. be that would be very easy to do because one of your other CRF bills had an appropriation to the food bank um, to meet need. And so you could just say that the money was, was reallocated to the food bank underneath that section of the, the CRF bill. I think it was, uh, I think it was Act 136 where that food bank appropriation was made. So it, it'd, be, it'd be very easy to do that. Um, can I just... Sorry, everyone. I just want to chime in quickly and suggest that you would definitely, I think it's a great idea, but I would just suggest reaching out, obviously, to the food bank um, to make sure that they could take on an additional allocation because I think they have like something like 4.7 million um, allocated already, which is amazing and we're super supportive of that. But I would just want to make sure that um, this was going to be something they could manage in addition to their, their workload already. Well, and I would, I would expect that um, appropriations and some other committees might have some questions in regards to us moving the money from ag to a totally different uh, part of the, of the CARES bill. You know, I mean, that's an appropriation issue, not an ag issue, and that that could um, get raised. Hey, um, Senator Starr, I just wanted to, did you see Linda just sent us a little message saying Abby Willard from the agency is listening in and would be happy to join the meeting if we had questions for the agency. Um, oh, um, so if I she, didn't if you to, Linda can let her in. Linda, are you there? Yes, and I can uh, send Abby an invitation right now if you want her to join the meeting. Yeah, she may as well get in on it. It's a pretty good little discussion. <laughs> See, and I, I think when we have a meeting like, like we're having today where certain people are in and they can get chimed in it, it's almost like in the committee room. It, uh, it, it's... It's working fine as far as I can see. I know Michael Ferrant was having a fit about us holding uh, the hearing, uh, but next week uh, we've got a bunch of people coming. But anyways. Um, so Could I just ask a question of uh, Michael, I guess. Uh, sure. Maybe if the food bank, I, I love Senator Polina's idea. That makes all the sense in the world. Uh, and I uh, was pleased to see sort of in related uh, arena that we put some money towards 
a group of restaurants that were working with the food bank to produce meals that had to be 10% local produce or 10% local products. And I didn't know um, if that, you know, so that also helps the restaurants as well as uh, families that are, are struggling to feed themselves. So I didn't know if that was separate from the food bank appropriation, but that, that strikes me as something related that is in the ag sector, but also a little bit outside. Yeah. Yeah. I just, uh, this is Ruth. I just wanted to weigh in on that a little bit. It's, it's a different program that um, is being run actually by an organization in Wyndham County, not by the food bank. Although I think the food bank is probably involved. I guess I would want to hear testimony on how well that's working because I've been trying to get something going in, in Addison County and it, it's not as easy as it sounds. Um, so uh, if we are thinking about putting more money into it, we definitely want to get testimony to see if it's effective and, and if it's working statewide. It may be working in Chittenden County and Wyndham County, but not in other places. Yeah, Windsor County too. It's never as easy as it should be, but I'm just thinking it's another option if, if we need an off-ramp that may be fruitful. Of course, we want to understand it's working. Yeah, absolutely. I, I also just want to say, let's not forget Caroline on the um, slaughter issue. Um, I, I know Senator Colin Moore was interested in that and I've just been skimming what she sent us and I'd be good to hear more while we have her here. Yeah, um, maybe uh, Abby, I see Abby's with us now. Uh, we've been talking about shifting some dates and some dates that you folks would like to see move. Um, we also talked about uh, how uh, moving the language uh, in uh, section five about the profitability from, uh, was it March through August or something? And you, you folks launched that non-dairy program uh, eight or 10 days ago, I guess. And, and how, if that would mess that program up, if we change deleted, that language about the profitability uh, so that more people could get in. And um, so maybe could you answer any questions in regards to that, Abby? Sure, good morning all. Welcome back, yeah. good to see you. Um, so around the deadlines, um, I think Senator Pearson, you said November 1st, November 15th. I think as much time as we could give applicants to apply through the programs, the better. So I think November 15th gives us sufficient time to review and process applications, um, communicate those recommended for funding to finance and management and have a cut check. Um, we did just hear from a dairy farmer yesterday that they applied last Thursday, or today, they applied last Thursday and they got notification yesterday that their application was approved. So we still need to then move that application through finance and through a budget check with our business office, then to finance and management for processing of payment and then execution of the check. But we were able to award a grant commitment within a week. So um, I think that three week time frame is probably our maximum amount of time we think we would need. So November 15th sounds good to me, good to us. Um, as, as Michael shared, we've probably received, well, we've seen 444 dairy applications initiated in the Salesforce application system. Only 182 applications have been officially submitted as of, I think this was yesterday or possibly this morning's data, yesterday's data. Um, so that's an additional 262 dairy assistance applications that are initiated, but not committed, not completed or submitted. In the Ag and Working Lands application yesterday, there were 104 total applications initiated in the system. 31 applications were submitted and none of those have yet um, received payment. We haven't even figured out the final steps in the review. We're working on filling out the final application review steps with VITA this week. Um, of the dairy applications, I think we've um, paid out 
just under $4 million, $5 million. So that gives you a sense of where applications are at at this point. Um, the question around um, the no net profit, um, I think we would agree it's a really problemsome category in the application. Um, and we did decide to make it an attestation. So it's just a checkbox, not something that they have to document and upload any materials to prove their no net profit. Um, it does, as Caroline was noting, it branches eligibility to the two different house bills. So the two do different working lands applications. Um, I think the question is really around timing. So the question would be how quickly would there be a change to the eligibility um, kind of markup that Michael is proposing um, and you all would need to approve before that change is officially made in the application. So if it takes a month to make that change, we still have that current requirement in the application that's gonna to continue to carry on as applicants apply. Um, we also are also waiting for the data to see how many of the applications get shuttled over to the house bills based on ineligibility, based upon a variety of criteria, but one could be that no net profit between March 1 and August 1. So we don't know that yet. Um, but we should have, we will have some of that data to share um, on the 31st when we do our next month's report. Um, well, he's gone, so I'm in charge. Um, Abby, thank you. Um, I'm going to call on myself. Do you, it's been suggested that technically removing that from your application flow is difficult, just the net profitability question. Do you have any comment about that? Are we talking about a consultant that gets paid a lot of money to make that one step go away? Or could you comment on that? Yeah, it's not it's not simple. I mean, I, I, hope, I hope that Secretary Tebbets shared how hard staff have been working for the last six months to get these applications submitted. It's people have been working 50 hour weeks, people are not taking their vacation within the agency to sort of get these live and moving. So it's very complicated um, re relationship with the MTX company who has been contracted by the states to build these various Salesforce applications. And we all had to get in queue because there were so many applications across the entire state of Vermont. So we launched the dairy application early on. Um, forestry was, or, you know, commerce was first, then there was dairy, then there was forestry, and then we were able to do the ag and working land. So that team only has so much capacity to make changes and modifications to applications. Once we have a go live date of an application, um, we have a limited amount of time to make modifications to that application under the current contract that we have with them. Once we exceed that time, then we are no longer under um, the funds, we're no longer covered by the funds that were appropriated through, through um, ADS to pay for those changes. So then any additional changes and modifications are the individual responsibility of the agency. So I think that Anson talked about that when he met with you so the other day. Where are we in that time window? Um, we just proposed, we're gonna propose changes right now, right today um, to MTX. And so we're still within that window today. But again, that's why I'm saying from a timing standpoint, um, you know, we hope the moment that we go live with, there's different phases. So we've gone live with the applica application opening. So businesses can submit applications. We are still working on phase two, which is how the review process happens and then how the applications get funneled to which pot of funds. We are still in that phase. Um, so I, I don't know if we have another few days. Our hope was to be able to start uh, processing payments, you know, next, this week, if not next week. Um, so it's, we're, we're talking days, I suspect, before we have a final application um, and are able to make any additional. All right, changes. well, maybe we'd ask you to, to um, I guess I wonder, you know, we need to understand if our colleagues are supportive of this, but, um, you know, I'm hearing you very clearly, we need to move this at lightning speed. And if there was some way of, of you know, putting a hold on it in terms of your own vendor timeline, 
maybe that's something worth exploring. But uh, Mr. Chair, we've just learned that, you know, yesterday would be uh, just barely soon enough to make this no net profit change in terms of the programmers and actually getting it into the process. Uh, we have no luxury of time. So it'd be real, pretty difficult. Now, did you talk about moving money from the non-dairy to the working lands program? Have you talked about that? <clears throat> so we understand, Abby, that you folks, if somebody applies and they've been making, uh, made a profit or show a profit, you've been switching them to the working lands program. Have you had any applications in yet that you've had to do that to? And is that an accurate statement? Yeah, Senator, we have received 31 again as of yesterday. So hopefully there's more as of today. I just don't have the printout in front of me, but 31 applications submitted in the Ag and Working Lands Assistance application as of yesterday. Of those 31, I have not looked to see how they end up being branched into which category of funds or which bill they need to be paid out of, either the, you know, the one of the two different working lands or the, um, the non-dairy bill. So we will have that information, or at least of the applications that we've received thus far by the time um, next Monday when we submit our report to you. Um, we have talked with partners and, and know that you heard kind of a, a position of the um, movement of any unspent non-dairy money to dairy. It may be interesting to consider um, a flexibility amongst those two. So if there's any non-dairy funds that are unexpended, whether those could funnel to, to the working lands or the non-dairy application. So maybe creating some fluidity amongst those categories, so, which would keep them in agriculture and would allow them to sort of respond to where there's the greatest demand and need. Um, especially if we extend the application deadline, I think that allows more time for the ag and working lands businesses to um, understand, have a moment to breathe in the growing season and be able to apply through the funds. Yeah. I think that the no net profit is troublesome in, in a sense um, because it is a very specific criteria. Um, and again, I think you heard testimony of that it just gives you a snapshot of time within the growing season. Um, you know, we found a way to work with that, that language, but um, I think the bigger challenge is just at what time, and I mentioned this earlier, Senator, at what time would that change come into effect? And at that point, how many applications would have already been funneled to the house bills? And, and again, I, we can give you that data, I think within a couple of days. Yeah, there was com uh, Ruth. Um, thanks, Senator Starr. I'm just wondering, Abby, if, if for example, we do get rid of this language, but it takes longer to do so because, well, you know our process. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and meanwhile, people are being funneled to the working lands fund. Um, is there a way to, if that fund is is expended fully, to then hold applications until such time that the language gets changed? Um, yeah, so that people great question. just get kicked out and told no. Um, sort of maybe they're put on hold but not denied. Yeah, I think we do have the capability to hold an application in a status of, of like an undefined status. So the moment that we as the agency recommend them for funding, then that does um, trigger a particular funding source, but we could probably hold those applications in a recommended for approval status. We have all the information we need, um, but we're not going to make a recommendation of um, for payment quite yet. Um, again, that will be related to the, the different deadlines in the bills that Michael shared. So the September 15th, the October 1st deadlines will come into effect pretty soon. So uh, we can only hold them so long, otherwise they would then be, you know, in fear of being denied funding altogether if, if the deadline were to come and go. <clears throat> um. Other questions for Abby on the workings of this? If, if not, uh, we'll, Caroline, would you like to get into your uh, 
Uh, Abby? Can I just make one additional comment, Senator, sure. around the $10,000 for farmers markets? So yes. um, <clears throat> it's, it is interesting to hear from NOFA that there's a concern about markets meeting that eligibility. Um, I, it may be uh, beneficial for the committee to also look at producer association groups who are also eligible under this category. Um, but may or may not be able to meet that $10,000 gross sales threshold to be eligible. Um, those are the only two sort of like non-business um, entities that are eligible in this section um, of um, what we're referring to as value added food products and ag producers. So, what was um, that one, Abby? The, um, ag producer associations. So they also are eligible for funds under the ag and working lands and they are similar in a sense to farmers markets and that neither one of them are actually businesses, but they are nonprofit organizations and you know small organizations that support a large number of ag businesses. So if you wanted to look at removing the eligibility criteria of having to have $10,000 in um, annual gross income, for farmers markets, you may wanna look at or take testimony on whether producer association groups would wanna be in that same category. We do know from some producer association groups that they do receive $10,000 in annual sales. Um, for example, the Maple Sugar Makers Association at the Big E or um, the Cheese Festival for the Vermont Cheese Council. So those are events that are not happening in 2020, but they typically happen. And so those associations would generally say they have that kind of gross annual income but I'm not sure that the beef producers or um, the veggie and berry growers association would be able to claim $10,000 in annual income. Yeah. <clears throat> Any other questions right now for Abby? If not, we'll uh, switch to Caroline in regards to meat and meat processing, or slaughter and processing. Just to say, thanks to Abby for jumping on so quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, You're welcome. Thank you, thank you Senator Starr. Um, yeah, um, we're um, under the umbrella of COVID related ag issues. We uh, don't want to miss out on the opportunity to also raise the issue of how COVID 19 impacted the bottleneck issue in slaughterhouses that we know. Um, of course, I'm not uh, an authority to claim that um, the, the truth of my following comment, which would be that I believe that um, COVID-19 dramatically increased this bottleneck uh, to a situation that slaughterhouses um, processing facilities are really booked out uh, to a for a much longer ex extended period of time, simply because there's also more homesteaders, uh, small livestock uh, producers who have now, um, um, out of a food security stance, um, started to raise livestock and there's just a higher uh, demand. And um, in order to prove that statement with some substance, I, um, I would advise the committee to take testimony from Ellen Kaler who has done, um, and, and er, er, when COVID uh, hit earlier uh, with a group of people, they've been uh, surveying all slaughter and processing facilities in the States, uh, um, in, in Vermont on, on this question, how COVID in, uh, impacted them. And I, excuse me, there was, it was loud. Um, and uh, she told me that, uh, yes, she does believe uh, all, all facilities are completely maxed out um, so that's the one point I want to make that uh, there is, uh, when, we, when we have this little bit of a session left, I think there is an urgent need to address this as an issue um, because, um, yeah, because of the associated um, um, scenarios that farmers don't, uh, don't know, uh, don't have access to processing their animals, which is creating costs and just dramatic um, like scenarios and um, <clears throat> what can mitigate this issue is now the question. You might've heard that the um, USDA has reached an agreement with Vermont that, um, um, so backing up a little bit in Vermont, there's two different um, 
um, regimes, uh, how to get meat inspected, state inspection um, and USDA inspection. And this agreement that was achieved allows now state inspected facilities to take animals from USDA inspected facilities uh, while still allowing that meat then to be sold out of state, which was not usually not the case for state inspected meat. Usually state inspected meat is only allowed to be sold within the state. Yes, that's great. Uh, we appreciate that, of course, but does that do anything uh, for the capacity issue we're facing? I uh, No, because it's just a marketability option, but it doesn't increase capacity in any way. We All the slaughterhouses are full, that's just the fact. So um, what else, what other tools do we have in our toolbox? And there I have to step up to my task. Working for Rural Vermont on farm slaughter is one of my issues. You know that uh, we have been advocating for that in the past. You know, this is an issue with a more comprehensive um, set of um, issues that we wanna work on. You know, there's still a sunset on the law and you can uh, expect us to come back uh, next biennium with a more comprehensive agenda. Um, but what we can maybe, what I'm thinking, what we maybe can do now, since we have COVID and we have the task to address COVID related act issues, is address the uh, capacity issue and just um, increase uh, the allowances for animals to be slaughtered under the on farm slaughter provision. Because when we look at the current numbers and you see there that it is five cattle and um, total so uh, and then the other allowed animal numbers are um, e it's either or it's a total combined life weight of 6,000 pounds that is currently allowed and that is is equal to five cattle um, if you imagine a, a dairy farm that wants to downscale um, that five cattle are slaughtered quickly um, so um, <coughs> our proposal that I submitted to you yesterday would would uh, suggest to increase from five to 20 cattle, from 50 to 30 pigs, and from 40 sheep or goats to 80 sheep or goats. And instead of having that be a total, a total life weight of 60 pounds, just to allow for all those numbers to be in addition to another, one another so that diversified farms who have cattle and pigs and sheep that they can slaughter 30 pigs and 20 cattle, for example. Caroline, have, have you found uh, where on farm slaughter, um, the farmers are been, have been selling out and running out of, um, running out of cust, or, no, running out of um, having plenty of customers, but can't slaughter enough animals to meet uh, their needs. Yeah, so what we what we did, um, I mean, I, I must admit that, of course, uh, my my year is also impacted by COVID-19 and the the off months from the legislative session is usually the time when I can um, more closely um, do, do what we call grassroots outreach and, and have this connection to our, to our farmers on the ground. And since we are so busy with the legislative session, it's more difficult this year than in any other year to have this relationship to the base so we have to kind of make use of tools like surveys more more now and um, so what I did is uh, just bounce this idea back with a survey that we were rolling out um, just a couple uh, weeks ago on August 18th uh, might not even be two weeks ago so it's just up and running so this is pre preliminary results from that and you see that to the um, survey there were um, about 40% of the respondents were farmers and of uh, and, and the other two thirds were either homesteaders or, or customers and um, almost all of them, everyone except one 73 respondents total of 74 respondents in this one and a half weeks um, all said that they would support an increase in allowances um, and um, most of them also supported this particular proposal while about 10% said that it uh, doesn't go far enough while about 5% said it, it may go too far. Um, and um, then there were also a few perspectives on maybe why, why cap the allowance at all. Um, why not just allow farmers to slaughter on farm slaughter in, in the way it, that system is laid out and not have a cap at all. 
Um, and then what I did just for you to have like more of a personable, because we don't have the time right now to take like a bunch of testimony and have all these farmers come in. Uh, I, I put in the survey uh, uh, a, an opportunity for everyone who responded to put some statements in support uh, of this. And so I, and I organized it here under the arguments that would speak to on farm slaughter. And those are like more, more local meat, uh, um, more lo uh, opportunities. Uh, it is good for farm viability. It, it is, is a symbol for food sovereignty and food security. It is very good for animal welfare. And it addresses the capacity issue, of course. Um, and I also uh, did a kind of a media scan and how that issue was um, was reported on by the media and uh, compiled some uh, quotes from from some articles that I found. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, uh, I would run to Brian. Thank you, Senator. Um, so, Caroline, I did read it all the way through. I, there's no date here. I'm assuming that since it's COVID related, if we were to change the, uh, the regulations, it would only be in effect for a certain amount of time. Do you have a sense of when that might work? I mean, uh, I think this, I, I hope that this is something that can be an advancement of the on-farm slaughter law in general and just make it as a tool more viable of an option for farms. So I would, my hope would be that the committee considers to increase the allowances for the on-farm slaughter law in general. And I mean, then of course it would be still under the sunset of 2023 uh, currently. And um, um, unless we would remove the sunset and the same, same swipe, but uh, it might be hard to justify that since that is not a COVID uh, related subject. Um, but um, I'm, I'm, I would be comfortable with leaving the sunset for now because we, we do want to uh, come back to you uh, next biennium with more comprehensive agenda. We do want to have a stakeholder process in the fall to have more of a conversation about also, you know, you, you will, when you take testimony from the agency about on from slaughter, you will probably um, find out that the, how, what the on from slaughter law is, is um, to the agency even, um, they're not that familiar with it even because it's, they don't pr promote it. It's, it's, it's still, um, I don't know how to call it, like the black, the, the, not so popular as a, as a, as an institution. And uh, of course we have the interest to make it more popular and more viable as an institution. And I think how the agency promotes that tool can, is, is critical for the success of it. So that's one issue then um, the whole process of um, that internal and slaughterers can only um, perform the slaughter and farmers are not allowed to do that is an issue that is often mentioned by farmers and the, the marketability and how that process is super wonky that customers have to buy basically a living animal and it's like a CSA sort of that you basically have to commit in advance to buying and sharing that uh, that animal uh, as a as a large group of people that then basically is able now to to break that down into manageable chunks um that is uh, those are all barriers to the accessibility of this option and and so we would want to look at that also like education and certification of of the uh, slaughter practices on farms is, is an issue that was dear to some itinerant slaughterers um, and educating more future generations of slaughterers uh, uh, as an issue. So there's more to discuss on this issue for sure, but the capacity uh, uh, issue of slaughterhouses, that's really the, the, the main issue. And maybe you come to a different solution in terms of how to, how to mitigate and how to address that, that, that subject matter, which is the core of, of, of what we should discuss, uh, but um, Rovermont is suggesting to utilize on from slaughter as a tool and just to increase the allowances and hope that that um, yeah, can carry fruit in this, uh, in this slaughter season, which is just rolling on. I just want to jump ahead of Ruth. I ju I'll just offer this. Since the basis for what you see as a COVID related problem is there's not enough capacity. I think it'll be probably an easier sell if we continue to, to bring the COVID thing in so that there's gotta be a sort of a date by which we take another look at it. I, I, don't, I don't think 
we'd be ready to just open it up and say, you know, you could do as much as you want forever now. I think there needs to be a, a little bit tighter um, period of time on it in order yeah. to, to sell this. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what I mean. The timeline is uh, already um, limited by the sunset. So if we don't do, if we don't review the law by 2023, July, 2023, it will come out of existence. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, Rose had a question. Yeah, I would agree with Senator Collmore that it seems like tying it to a limited time, even maybe before 2023, I don't know. And then we have a compare and contrast uh, period. But Carolyn, I didn't hear a direct answer to the question that I think Senator Collimore asked about whether or not farmers are bumping up to the limits right now. I mean, you obviously have a survey that says there's support for a change, but are they bumping up? Are you hearing from farmers that I'm at my max, I can't do more? Just no. a quick answer to that. No, um, good, thanks for um, bringing that back into the conversation. I, I don't think that the um, allowances are completely exhausted. I think the tool can be still also just more utilized if people would be just more aware of it and if it would be promoted more. That's, that's I, I kind of try to um, um, come in from that perspective. I, I believe that the allowances are not exhausted completely also because it's just as a tool not that popular. Okay, so if we increase the max, we, it might not have any, the effect we're looking for because they're not bumping up against it right now. Because it's a pretty big jump. You're doubling, you're quadrupling the number of cattle. Um, yeah, so then yeah, my but, other question is, but, are there enough yeah. itinerant slaughterers to even meet the demand? If we made these increases, are there people who can do it? Yeah. Those are both very good questions. And, and just to one more comment to the previous question, I think that many, may, my assumption is, um, and my argument is that maybe many farms have not considered going through the wonky process of unfarm slaughter because the allowances is so minuscule and they don't think it's a viable option. Um, so that could be one reason for why it's not utilized enough is, is that it's too little of an allowance. Um, <coughs> And the um, itinerant slaughter, I, I don't think there's enough itinerant slaughters. It's, it's, a, it's a hard to grasp community because they're, um, um, you know, they're, they don't like to engage in advocacy and they um, like to stay among um, themselves to some degree. And many of the performing itinerant slaughters I've talked to and that I had the chance to get to know are also uh, getting old. Um, so uh, that is an issue, but um, the idea would be potentially to have the hunting community potentially being, um, being a, a group of people that could maybe step up to the challenge. Because I mean, cu currently, as we know, it's not regulated who is an itinerant slaughter. An itinerant slaughter is basically just something who slaughters other than the farmer. For that, uh, for that customer who, um, who you know, who hires that person, um, so it can it can be um, it can be anyone who has the skill, but not the farmer them, themselves. Right. So, so I guess what I'm hearing is that this is a, a proposed fix to a problem that we've all heard about that that there's not sufficient slaughter facilities, um, that you know there's a problem nationwide and thankfully we've been uh we've escaped the horrible infections at at slaughter facilities but there's still a shortage of facilities and i you know this is an interesting proposal but it's still not clear to me that this would actually provide any fix if we're not bumping up against the current uh yeah. ceiling and if we don't have enough itinerant slaughterers we can change this but it might not do anything so I guess I'd, I'd like to hear more, um, maybe get more testimony if we're gonna consider doing this because you know, it's yeah. nice to say we did something, but if it doesn't do anything, that's another issue. Yeah, and I think the promotion, how to promote this as an opportunity is, uh, um, is uh, for me, it is a question for the agency to step up to the task also to show to the ag community more openly that this is a, actually a, a tool that exists in our toolbox. And I think just many, many farmers are not, a, are really uncertain with what it is, how it functions and all that. And Rural Vermont is just a very small organization with not a million heavy budget to, to do this by ourselves. 
Should we, you know, as a as a committee, we might we might be better off to expend our energy and our money in advancing uh, some of the slaughter facilities that we're already supporting and to have them increase their, uh, their output uh, financially somehow so that farmers could at least get their animals to, um, if you get to a regulated slaughterhouse, then you could sell in the way the new law is, you could sell that meat in, in uh, other New England states. In Massachusetts, uh, you know, yeah. they were, they were really, uh, uh, they really panicked when they couldn't get any red meat into their stores. And uh, so, you know, if we do on farm slaughter, spend our time doing that, which we don't know if it'll amount to anything anyways, because we don't know if, if uh, they're bumping up against their numbers. If we I did mean, it. One more, uh, just quick, quick response uh, to that. I think that's an interesting um, thought. The, the the advantage, of course, of on-farm slaughter as a tool is, is it's like decentralized, and everybody could do it, like plan it um, independently, and just do do it and uh, realize this as an option for themselves. While increasing capacity of a central slaughter facility. Um, can be an issue in terms of uh, COVID and, and infection risks uh, when you put more staff in, uh, in one building and or uh, being more of a long-term prog uh, project that is not uh, feasible for immediate relief because the implementation and planning just eats up so much time. And what if you would take testimony from Ellen Kaler, indeed, uh, she's indeed suggesting that what Vermont really needs is more um, Vermont packing house-like um, institute uh, facilities, at least two more, I think was what I heard, but she will um, speak for herself. So that that's just, a, I, we would support that, but it's um, uh, not, again, the question is how feasible is that immediately? Yeah, because yeah. that's also, that's a longer term um, infrastructure issue as well, building out the slaughterhouses and finding people to work in the slaughterhouses. I, I think, but I understand what people are saying about how doing this proposal that Royal Vermont's proposing would not, maybe it's trying to solve a problem that we're not sure we have. On the other hand, I don't see a downside to doing it either because it would give people the opportunity to expand the on-farm on slaughter. And we could do it in a way that said that with some of these other things we've done with COVID-19, we've said this would go into place until, I think we've said either 30 or 60 days past the state of emergency is deemed past. Anyway, I, I mean, I don't see the committee moving in this direction necessarily, but I just think, I, I just don't think there's a downside to allowing more on farm slaughter at this point. <clears throat> Any other questions on on farm slaughter? We, we need uh, more data on, in regards to that, Caroline. If, you know, if you could get us some numbers uh, somehow. Um, what kind of numbers? Pardon? What other numbers you're looking for? Well, if like bumping up against their their animals that they're already doing, if they're getting a lot more calls than what they're uh, able to handle, so they're having not to be able to do this. Um, you know, any of those kinds of issues to justify us doing this because you know, we're, we're on a three to a four week window with our full set session here. And, uh, you know, we've already got a little lifting to do to get some changes to our existing COVID programs that we've got going and to get public testimony and, and you know, to do all what it should take to do a bill, um, I don't know if we even have enough time, but, yep. uh, you know, we I, could we could try. Uh, Ruth had a question. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment really. And I mean, I, I think if this would solve, there's no, 
I would be supportive of it given what we're hearing about ha what's happening elsewhere in slaughter facilities. And it is a much longer term issue to try to expand the capacity of Vermont's yeah. smaller facilities. I just want us to know whether this is going to solve a problem or not, or if it's just to, a way to expand on farm, farm slaughter. Is it actually going to solve a problem that is presented to us by COVID, or is it just a way to promote on farm slaughter? I, you know, there's a difference there. And when we're trying to focus on meeting problems during an emergency, we need to make sure that this is solving the problem that we think it might solve. So that's why I would like to see more data on whether or not farms are hitting that max, whether or not there are enough uh, slaughter, you know, itinerant slaughters. Um, and it sounds like, you know, hearing from Ellen Kaler and probably um, the agency as well would be helpful in this regard as also. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Go ahead, Caroline. I, I can provide you. I did. Um, I was, of course, expecting this question. So I did do a public record request for the up to date uh, registration and reporting um, numbers. So I can for forward that uh, to you. And I uh, can also already say that there is still a disparity uh, between how many registrants have actually followed through with their reports and on the other side reports it seems to be like maybe there also have been reports made that have not been um covered by a re registration and prior to that so um the the catherine mcnamara the meat inspection chief from the agency of agriculture will be able to speak to those numbers and explain them and um when you see those and for us they are very disappointing um uh, realities um we we as i said earlier the um part of the issue is this the, un, the legal uncertainty to, that goes with the, the complexity of this tool um, as an institution. And um, I, I, it is though, um, um, we also have uh, um, farmers that have been successfully utilizing on-farm slaughter for many years, have been doing it since the, uh, the, since the allowance, has, since uh, it's been legalized as a tool and um, and that are familiar with the process and for, for whom it uh, works well. Uh, Chuck Wooster from Sunrise Farm is one of those who's like been slaughtering the 40 lambs um, uh, every year with unfarm slaughter and um, uh, a couple others come to mind as well. And um, for whom they say yes, for farm viability, if there would be an increase that would uh, be helpful. And especially those smaller um, animals, uh, as you know, have always had more issues of getting the slaughter uh, slots in the in the in the slaughter facilities. Um, so I don't know in how far there's uh, room for testimony on that, but I actually have a written testimony from a um, homesteader that is uh, this year trying to commercialize, who says he's already um, at capacity with his pigs, and I will forward that uh, written testimony to you as well. Yeah. <clears throat> um, other questions for Caroline? No. And uh, well, thank you, Caroline. And, thank you. Uh, and we'll, uh, you know, we'll talk about this. And have you met with the House Committee at all in regards to this? Yeah, I had a phone conversation with Carolyn Partridge and um, uh, John O'Brien and Sharon Fogard about this, and they're all interested. But they also said if Mitzi Johnson doesn't um, identify this as an issue to, um, to, to consider even in, in this current situation that they are, um, you know, they're following leadership and um, uh, but they have talked about it um, uh, and they're yesterday and was it yesterday? They have talked about it this week in committee. <laughs> they did, but they, they touched on it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, uh, Caroline and, um, you know, for bringing that forward. Um, so uh, Maddie is Maddie left. So I think she's gone. Um, Maddie's here. Oh, did you have anything else you wanted to bring up before the uh, committee today, Maddie? Sorry, I guess she's not. I guess not. <laughs> um, so, um, well, with the committee, uh, I was just going to ask if you'd like to hear from uh, Alan, Alan Taylor on this and 
and uh, the ag agency uh, maybe sometime next week if you know uh, I Chris? guess I wouldn't mind hearing but I don't I don't necessarily think it's going to go anywhere for this this time of, I don't know well, it's going to be tight if it does go anywhere, uh, Chris. Uh, I mean, I'm open to hearing about it. I, I, I am supportive of the idea, but um, I think the tweaks to the dates and particularly this net profit thing uh, have got to be priority. And if we can move something just as quickly as possible, if you're aware of changes that that maybe uh, Senate Approps and others are doing in a bill that's moving fast. I really yeah. hope we can get some language together and get that cooking along. Um, so that to me has to be, in terms of our timeline, the priority. Well, uh, talking with Jane um, and in Approps, the way I understand the whole deal, there's gonna be like one amendment to, to our COVID uh, funding issues uh, with, uh, with, of course, quite a few different sections. And I don't know, if, Michael, have you heard anything in regards to any amendments? No, it's just, it's a, it's a subject matter that's gonna be um, on our agenda for our legal staff meeting on Monday, um, yeah. how we're gonna put that bill together, et cetera. Um, that that's all I know as of now. Yeah, um, Rose. Yeah, I just want well, I I agree with Chris. Obviously, our our priority needs to be uh, those technical changes or fixes to the bills that we already passed. Um, I, I do think getting testimony from Ellen just in general may be helpful on this um, issue um, on that restaurant program thing that Chris mentioned earlier. And just in general, because her ear's been to the ground on the suit, uh, you know, food and farm, uh, just writ large um, over the summer and how things are working. So getting Ellen in to testify would be just good on a number of topics. Um, the other thing I just wanted to make a request is if we could get um, Susanna Davis to come testify on the governor's proposal for um, the providing uh, payments to migrant farm workers and other immigrants who didn't receive the uh, uh, stimulus, stimulation, no, stimulus, stimulus payments in the spring. Couldn't think of the word. Um, I, I know that it's, it's in the governor's budget and since we spent time on it in the spring and couldn't actually get to uh, something that worked, I'd love to hear what the uh, governor's proposal is. Um, I know it's probably out of our hands. It's probably in approps, but just to um, have a little closure, um, that would be good to hear from Susanna or whoever in the administration could provide us with the details. Yeah, yeah. A quick question from Michael. Michael, why is that legal now, and it wasn't quite legal this spring, and everybody was worried about climb back after we paid the money out and all that. Do you know if there's been some changes somewhere along the way that's allowing, allowing that? Or is it only payments they're talking about to migrant farm workers that actually pay into social security and in all the other ish, uh, places? Well, the legal discussion previously, it was about using CARES Act money. Yeah. And, and I believe the proposal is now is not about using CARES Act money. It's about using state funds. General fund money? Yes. I, be I, I believe, believe it's that's general correct. Fund money. I think that's going to move awful hard and slow because there is no extra general fund money. I mean, I, I don't know where he's coming from with that, but. Um, Can you all hear me now? This is Maddie again. I'd like to hear some more from the administration on that. And, and leadership has um, expressed at least tentative support for it. Um, so hearing more about how it's structured and, and what they ended up proposing 
would be helpful because I can't find details on it. Um, and since, yeah, like I said, since we had uh, discussions in the spring, I just really like to hear how they made it work. Yeah. Well, we'll we'll get them in, but um, so, so they they, don't, they haven't necessarily made it work. They just made a proposal, so they tend to have a tend they have a tendency to do that, you know. Yeah, that's true, Anthony. You're absolutely right. So. <laughs> It may not actually be working the way we would want it to be, but it's worth thinking about, worth hearing about, I agree. Um, yeah, um, so uh, any anything else that, um, that anyone wants to bring up? Um, I know those. Matt does. does. Maddie might have something. <laughs> yeah, uh, Maddie tries to comment because um, NOFA and Rule Vermont have been um, supporting the migrant justice uh, ask throughout the uh, last couple of uh, weeks. So we, can, we could also give a, a quick update if that is uh, desired. Yeah, well, I, I think we're all supportive of it. Uh, supportive of it. Uh, the big issue is trying to use up some of this COVID money and yeah. and transferring that to something else that's going to free up general fund money um, that's all above board is it gets difficult down in in the corner room down the other end of the hallway um, so uh, anyway can you all hear me uh, yeah Oh, thank you. You probably, you might've heard my dogs barking a minute ago. Sorry about that. I've been trying to pipe in. Um, yeah, I would, I would definitely support um, Senator Hardy's suggestion of having Susanna Davis come in and testify. I think she, she could give a lot of insight um, from the administration's perspective. Um, and yeah, we have been supporting this proposal and um, have actually also been supporting seeing the number increase based on what we know of the number of immigrant families here in Vermont. Um, so I would welcome more discussion about that. And I also just wanted to chime in with one more thought on the discussion about uh, reversion for any um, unspent dairy and non-dairy funding. I wonder if um, something that would be worth considering would be kind of, again, having the food bank come in and, and speak with you all. And they might be able to, to suggest, you know, a maximum amount that they could realistically spend um, in the time allotted because, based on the timelines that we're talking about now, it seems like that, that turnaround would be really quick. Um, I assume they wouldn't, you know, even get that reversion money until the second half of November, or first half of December, which would make it really, really quick for them. So it might be interesting to explore um, figuring out what's the most that they could spend and then having the remainder, you know, go into working, for example, which is a um, pot of money for, both non-dairies and dairies and forestry businesses to access. So I just wanted to throw that idea in the mix. Well, basically, you know, we're just getting to September next week. And, um, you know, I, I think that that particular issue about having extra money, money left over is still a, it's still a big question mark whether there will be any or not, and whether or not uh, our the crew that we oversee and look after are are getting as much as they need. Um, so, but that's something that um, we could certainly keep in mind and and get them in just to hear them out. Uh, Anthony, did you have a question? Yeah, we've, I should know the answer to this, but the question is whether or not, if we use the food bank as an example, if we move those funds to the food bank, they don't have to necessarily have, have spent it by the end of December. We just have to have sent it to them by the end of December. Is that true, Michael? No, did I get that wrong? Michael? They have to, they have to expend it. Oh, okay, then that's, yeah, that is in right, the problem. So, yeah. Right, so the, 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 there's two different ways that, that that these grants are working for example the dairy assistance grant that is that's looking backwards and paying for costs or expenses that have already been incurred right so the the, the that's already been an expense so all you need to do is you need to just uh, allocate that money to the farmer or a similar 
applicant and that, that you've met the expenditure requirement. For things in the future, like the food bank, you're paying the food bank to buy money for, to provide future food services. They have to make that expenditure by December 30th. Okay, thanks. I had that wrong. Yeah, um, any, anything else? Michael, would you uh, work on, a, on altering your draft to match what we're going to try to do or have to offer? Yep, so I'd be moving the application deadline from October 1st to November 15th. Uh, I will strike the um, net profit provision. I will, uh, I didn't hear any input about changing the December 1st deadline for the timeline for when you get to show economic harm. Um, uh, yeah, I think, didn't Abby talk about that? About that so, December 1st deadline? Oh, I, what I about the addendum date uh, you're going to move from October 1 to December 1? Uh, I think that makes sense, yes. Yeah. Um, but then it's about the, the time frame for when you show economic harm. Do you want it to be beyond December 1st? Um, that how, how, how are consider applicants showing economic harm beyond their application date? Yeah. If the application um, date is November 15th, how would yeah. how do, I don't remember our conversation about it's, that? It's, do, it's it's they can get potential expenses, right? Um, that they need to implement, uh, say to implement a farm stand or something like that. Um, the, the, they have that ability underneath both of the programs. Um, so they, that's how that they they could do it. Yeah, okay. or, or when they just can document it in any way. Um, for example, farmers markets um, that have been canceled, winter farmers market that have been canceled and the market managers can confirm that in writing, then a farmer that doesn't have that um, marketability there can project the loss, the losses from that. I, I'm interested in, in us being as uh, consistent as possible. So. What do we have? Does anybody know what we have at ACCD for those programs in terms of this December question? No, I, I don't. I don't. I can look into that. What, what about making the funds uh, more flexible for the agency to be able to move uh, from one fund to another? I would support that, yeah. So could, could you try to figure out how we could do that, uh, Michael? Sure, that, that would be in, in that reversion language right now. It's just allowing the secretary to reallocate from non-dairy to dairy. But it sounds like you want to give the secretary the authority to reallocate from any of the programs to any of the other programs. Well, if there are big holes, I mean, if they run out of money in one, they've got a big pot sitting right beside it. Um, I would think that would be, after a certain date, that would be fine. Okay. Well, I don't so, know what the committee thinks. You got an opinion on that? I've always supported that. The question is the date a little bit. Uh, if this, if November fifteenth is the end of the applications, um, maybe After that's that. the date because they would understand if there's more need. But I, I I I'm struggling to understand how we handle the date. Because right now it's September fifteenth, right? And he, right. he the agency can move just one way. So it, it does seem like. Abby, I don't know if you want to weigh in on this. If it's if the application deadline is November fifteenth, and we make that the deadline after which the agency can move funds around, then you can sort of fill in the holes based on where the application demand is. is does that seem reasonable? 
Yeah, and I think we probably should, I should think about this with our logistical team a bit also. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're thinking the same way, which is have the application deadline at a certain date that then allows us some time to do some moving around of funds before we have to determine which mm -hmm. pot of resources supports which application and still meets our December 30th deadline to have all dollars okay, expended same. and out the door. Yeah. So, yeah, there is some kind of a little bit of negotiation there, but I think, and, and thinking about aligning it with other agencies is also a, a good idea since some of the same eligible businesses and agriculture can also apply to Commerce's economic recovery grant program. So we too are trying to be as equitable as we can. And the two and a half million of the working lands money actually comes to the agency through Commerce. And so we actually need to meet the same Commerce requirements in that subset of those funds as Commerce needs to, which is another complication of our resources um, in the Ag and Working Lands application. So that's why we, another reason why we have a variety of eligibility criteria that needs to be met in different circumstances. So Michael, you could get something drafted up, but the date would, would we just hold it until we uh, hear back? Yeah. I'll put uh, November 15 in as just a placeholder yeah. and then uh, you can change that however you would like. Um, any anything else uh, that that anybody can think of that uh, um, we need Michael to work on between now and and next Tuesday or yeah we meet next Tuesday no uh, all set uh, yes we're gonna count on you to find the fastest moving vehicle there is there Mr Chair. Well, um, I'll, uh, I'll keep an eye out for it. And if we can jump on, we'll take a ride. You just Maybe got a brand new vehicle. Yeah, I was just going to say, it's Bobby's new car. Oh, yeah? <laughs> well, it, it arrived all in one piece with no extra jams or scratches. So that's good. <laughs> um, could, could, I just, could I just say... There is an ag bill on the Senate calendar up for second reading right now. It's the chicken composting bill. <laughs> you the calendar? Add it right it's, on. It's on the calendar. Um, uh, but did that it, make the leadership list? I don't. I don't know. I don't did. know if it made the leadership list, but if you're looking for something that's Okay. Potentially germane that you could amend that bill and add something to it. That might be something to talk to leadership about. So could we get that amendment by one o'clock? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we probably better visit with uh, with uh, powers to be, and and I think we're fine. But we'll we'll uh, talk about that next week uh, if. If we run into a snag along the way, um, we'll figure something out. Um, that might be some sweet justice, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, any anything else from anybody? If not, uh, thanks a lot, and uh, we'll thank you, Abby and Caroline and Maddie, and we'll see you other guys at one on uh, yeah one o'clock. Uh, on the Senate floor. So right. thanks and have a good weekend if I don't catch up. Thank you all. Thank you all so much. I appreciate you.